So welcome you to the to the uh, Income Tax Management for Egg Producers uh, seminar. My name is Ron Hogan. I am uh, a farm management specialist with the Extension Service, and we try to do this tax uh, seminar every year for tax preparers and and producers who want to want to keep up with it with the tax provisions. Um, I wanted to say that we are recording this today, just for your own information, and we have all of you muted. So any questions that you may want to ask the, the presenters, please type your question into the chat box. And uh, so with that, I will um, get on to our first speaker. Um, he is Alan Gregerson. He's with the IRS. He is the, he is the, um, the uh, stakeholder liaison person. He's out of Bloomington, Minnesota. And he's been doing this for many years, and we've had our we've had him for uh, as a speaker for quite a few years now. So with that, I will turn it over to Alan. Thank you, Ron, for inviting me once again. My name is Alan Gregerson. I'm a senior stakeholder liaison from Minnesota. I do presentations around the area, including North Dakota and Minnesota, and other states. So what? My job is basically is do outreach presentations to practitioner industry, all kinds of groups. And I also listen for if you have any issues that the, the practice policy or procedure of the IRS isn't working. Basically, that's saying the system isn't working the way it should. And if we see those issues as a system issue, elevate them to me. I research the manual to see what should be done. And we elevate that issue directly to the owner and the IRS. So it goes from me through my working group nationwide up to the top right away. So if you see something that's not working right, uh, let me know. And my email is right down there right away to start it out. Alan.j.gregerson at irs.gov. I'm an IRS employee for almost 37 and a half years. So I've been in the call site. I've been a revenue agent. I've been in the tax for education. I've been with electronic filing. I've been with outreach. I've done a number of things. So I, I have a number of uh, friends in the IRS so I can kind of phone a friend inside if I don't know the answer. And sometimes I've had to do that because there's one side and another side and I had to re resolve that. So I had phone a friend and that friend gave me the right answer. So I uh, so I got the, the matter resolved basically on the answer. So what am, my purpose is just IRS updates to 145. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the ERC and some, but again, what I'm talking about, there's more slides than I have time to cover, but I think it's good material. So that's why I put it in there. So I'm gonna be touching the slides, the important points on it. And so we'll briefly go over a quick review of the ERC, but then I wanna talk about what we are seeing in the ERC. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the Indo Inflation Reduction Area, uh, Act. And I'll also talk a little bit about uh, National Tax Security Awareness Week that's going on right now. So with that, uh, continue on here. So we'll just go over the ERC overview kind of here, remember, the CARES Act, the Tax Relief Act, the American Rescue Plan Act, and the Infrastructure, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, all part of this ERC legislation. It tells you which quarter it applies to. Um, so common question I get here basically in terms of that is where which one is applying to what quarter? Well, this is a nice slide that tells you which part of the act applies to which one. And for the ERC, the employee retention um, credit basically where that is for the employer to keep the people on the books as an employee rather than laying them off because of COVID situation. And so there was a credit to allow for the employers to do that basically. So the employer types basically was an employer carrying on a trade or business, a tax exempt employer, tribal entities basically carrying on a trade or business, but it doesn't include government employees for 2020 and most in 2021 and household workers. So I did talk to some people in the audit area and one of the most one of the air they said right away oh there's some government employers looking for the employee retention credit well they're not eligible basically in terms of that so those were in the the uh, audit area to be audited obviously it came back that 
they don't qualify part of the eligibility rule for ERC. So one of those started there. Remember the eligibility request, full or partially suspended operations due to COVID-19 government orders. So there's gotta be a government order out there, or they had this requisite decline in gross receipts. And if it's a third and fourth credit, basically uh, in the 2021 year, if you meet the definite recovery startup business on here in terms of that. So those are the general eligibility. We can go in, there is more detail on it, but I just wanna make sure you know the general rule on it. Again, the limitations, 2020 was 50% up to 10,000 qualifying uh, employee, basically qualifying wages per employee. That's the QW. And 2021, it's 70% up to 10,000. The maximum of 7,000 per employee per quarter. In 2020, it was the maximum of 5,000 per employee for that period on it. And so we know that here, there's certain uh, information that's out there to clarify, but I want to talk about the key areas of the compliance what the IRS is seeing basically. First of all, the employer may not use the employee retention credit wages if they're receiving certain other tax benefits that are non-tax benefits. And that would be basically the PPP loan, the Paycheck Protection Program that you can use the wages for the PPP loans, but you can't in addition, use it for the ERC. If you use it for the PPP loans, can't use it for the ERC. But if you have additional amount after the PPP loan in the for the ER for the wages for the ERC, you can use them basically. And notice 21 dash 21. 2021-20 talks about that basically in terms of that. Now you wanna make sure um, when you do have PPP loans that they have been forgiven through SBA basically on it here. Here's kind of a chart here, it says the number of loans here in terms of the PPP loan forgiveness. There's a number of loans of 11.5, number of loans forgiven, 10.6. So what that means is that we've had not every loan was forgiven. Maybe they didn't apply for the forgiveness process. Maybe there's something else happening. Don't know, but not all of the loans were totally forgiven. Now, in terms of the audit, if the loan's not forgiven, basically, it's income. So you'd wanna make sure when you talk to your client, they went through that process and you know, they got a PPP loan, they met the criteria, it was forgiven by SBA. Otherwise it is income and may be subject to an audit again. PPP loans are income unless they go through the process of SBA, Small Business Administration um, forgiveness basically. And it talks about the loan amount. So uh, 758, uh, billion was forgiven. Seven. There was a loan of 790 million, excuse me, billion out there for PPP loans. Other wages. So you can, if you're using it for PPP, you can use it. If you use it for PPP, you can't use it for ERC. If you're using it for on some of these other credits, can't use it for ERC. And here's a list of these other credits basically on it. So if you're taking the working operative opportunity credit using wages in this calculation, can't use it for the ERC. So keep that in mind. And also here's an important one to mention. I hear a lot of discussion on that. So you've got to reduce your deduction for wages on the business income tax return by this employee retention credit allowed on the employment tax returns, which would be your nine. 41 series basically in terms of that. So you get the employee retention credit. You've had your wages on the books there. Got to reduce it by the credit. The credit's going to be reducing that wages. I think this is kind of missed. And I think that's an item just to make sure uh, you do look at. If a credit is later claimant on an amended, um, Employment tax return, the corresponding income tax return may also need to be amended to reduce this wage expenses claimed on the original return. So again, if you get the credit, need to do the reduction on the employee's 
wages basically on it here. The statute, there's kind of, I get questions on this a lot here in terms of that um, for the ERC. The ERC for the third and the fourth credit quarters of 2021, and if you look at the IRC, the code section 3134L, basically that has a five-year period of statute on it. The others have three years basically in terms of that. So if you're looking at that ERC in the third and fourth credit of 2021, and only that quarter, those quarters, they have a five-year statute, otherwise three years. That's a common question that I see and people have, and a lot of people are not sure. They all think maybe it's three years for everything. No, nope, there is a little bit difference for this third and fourth credit, fourth quarters of 2021 here. Again, if there's fraud involved in ERC, there's no specified time limit to assess tax. And that's a code section that talks about it. Now, what's interesting is that we do know there's fraud out there in the area and the commissioner has said that, and we'll talk a little bit about that here, but I wanna talk about why, what they're seeing. Of course, we've seen the first potential is that it's a government employee, government entity and looking for uh, a ERC and it's not allowed. So that's kind of one thing we see, but here's some characteristics of potential ERC fraud. And it'd be just be aware of these in terms of that. Uh, this is what we see in terms of that here. Um, we see fixed, fictitious businesses, basically. So they, we see newly created after the CARES Act was enacted. So we see when it came in, in place, basically, on those laws up previously on it. And then we look at to see when did this business start basically now? So we look at these indications. So there are some of them uh, in these fictitious business newly created after the CARES Act was enacted. The employment tax returns filed for preceding that precede the entity establishment date basically on it here. We see no corresponding income tax returns and we see no corresponding W-2s. So if you're going to have the ERC, we know we're going to have to have some wages. We're going to have to have some W-2. We're going to have to have some income returns. And we would like to see this entities operating before this happened and not a newly created one. So again, those are things that we see of the potential ERC fraud that they are seeing. He's also potential ID theft in here as we see multiple original returns filed for the same entity. We see a dormant filing history prior to the enactment of the CARES Act. So this entity is really dormant, not any kind of activity, but now it starts in starts functioning just prior to the enactment of the CARES Act again. Now, remember, the IRS can look back on filing in terms of that. They have a lot of records and they can look back on different uh, uh, items to verify these claims. Also, the entity is created under the tax identification number or the TIN of a deceased person or somebody who is incarcerated in terms of that. So they apply for a TIN number basically on it. And that person, remember, we put the name on there. Uh, we have a name uh, blank on that for that, who it is, is somebody incarcerated. So again, those are characteristics of potential ERC fraud that we see. We also see inconsistent wage reporting. Now, remember the W-2s tie out to the W-3s tie out to the 941 for the four quarters here. So if they all tie a, uh, uh, tie together or reconcile, we have that's fine. But if they don't, there's a combined and withholding report that comes out or called a car report. And we ask why these don't match. Well, in these ERC frauds, there's inconsistent wage reporting on it, on those car reports. If they came out really quickly, we would see there's inconsistency on it here. Also, if the original or amended return is prepared by an individual or a firm that is under civil or criminal investigation here. And also, uh, if we see 
uh, the area of significant payroll increase after CARES Act was enacted. Because again, uh, we have a larger payroll increase basically on it here. That's going to impact a CARES Act more than usual on it here again. So you're just kind of thinking if a person would put in for it, they meet the criteria and you want to make sure you meet the definitions out there in terms of qualified wages, in terms of all the definitions that they have. It's in the right period. You meet all those technical words. That's what you need to do. So I asked the uh, auditor here, um, it's always good to really have good information to show, yes, you met these terms, you've defined them, you've, 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 uh, you've got the amount here from the books and records, and you've done all that you need to prove that claim. You don't want to send a claim that you're missing a lot because then it comes back or will be, uh, will be not allowed basically. So you wanna meet all the criteria that you need to in terms of that. There's also continued more rulings, notices that came out ERC. There's one that comes out on uh, if you're in the supply chain, the supply chain basically. So we're, we're get, the supply chain is interrupted. You're not getting your product. And so you have a situation where um, is that a government order or not? The supply chain has to have uh, the government order to shut down to meet that criteria of government uh, shutdown basically on it here. So we see some of those coming in as the supply chain was interrupted basically, but it wasn't before because of government uh, shutdown. So again, some a lot of those here. So what do we did is you see up in the top there, IR 2023-169 is uh, dated September 14, 2023. So the commissioner came out to said, uh, to protect taxpayers and scams, the IRS orders immediate stop to new employee retention credit processing amid the surge of questionable claims concerns from tax pros, basically. So if they were in before the 14th, they would continue to process those. But after that, to the end of the year, so far as we know, those would be put on hold, basically, in terms of that. Um, on the uh, employee retention program again it so they they're aware of many claims for this credit were not proper meeting the criteria i mentioned some of those things that they looked at and saw that they weren't proper so they put a moratorium on these erc claims but they also came up with IR 2023-193, and this came up in October 19, 2023, is that um, that's an IRS release, basically. So if you go on the web and put that number in, you'll come up with this information. But it was October 19th it came out. It is it talks about an IRS announced a withdrawal process for employee re retention claims, a special initiative aimed at helping businesses concerned with an eligible ineligible claim. So, for example, maybe you said to your client, "You don't qualify," but maybe your client went and saw these ads and went over to them and say, "What's uh, it, would I qualify?" And maybe they did put in. Well, there is an initiative basically on it here. If you meet the criteria, basically, and it tells you what you need to do to meet the criteria in this, uh, that you can withdraw it. Basically, it's saying you can withdraw it here in terms of that. But if in the situation here, so let's look at it here. Who can withdraw from the claims? Now it talks about it all in this IR 2023-193. I'm just gonna briefly go on it. So it really lays it out how you have to do it, what you need to do basically in terms of that. But you can use this ERC claim withdrawal process if all of the following apply. You filed an adjusted employment tax return. That's a 941 basically, uh, 940. 3x 944x or a ct1x so you filed an adjusted employment tax return amended employment tax you come claim the erc only no other adjustments and you want to withdraw the entire amount of the claim it's unpaid claim or the claim is paid 
but you haven't cashed the deposit. It talks about the different ways what you need to do in terms of the check or whatever. So it's either unpaid, haven't paid it, or you've been paid it, but you haven't cashed the check. And there's there's processes on each one, but it lays it out very specifically what you need to do. So there's really no questions. How do you need to document? But there is that special withdrawal process available so that it, it could be a help for you. We want to talk about internet platforms on 1099 filings. So now that you've heard, basically, we used to have the information returns, the 1099 series and those information returns that come out, that it used to be 250 or more that we talked about the electronic filing in terms of that. Well, it's moving down in the 2023 tax year or when you file in the 2024 filing season, which you would uh, in January, it will talk about uh, that you need, it goes down to the number 10. So 10, any kind of combination of these 1099s up to 10 needs to be electronically filed. So you all heard most likely that the IRS got additional money. Some of it has been taken back, but part of this in, uh, was to set up an internet platform in-house basically to send 1099 filings. Now we do have the file information return electronically or the fire system that continues on. So you still can use that uh, if you're using that and you're, you're satisfied with how it does. But the new platform basically is a new one. It's kind of the new kid on the block basically on it. Now, I don't know if this will be consolidated as years go forward, enhancements come in, but I'm thinking it may in the future. It's not there yet, but there is what's called the IRIS system, Information Returns Intake System, or IRIS that is commonly on it. And this came in on beginning of January 9th, 2023, uh, used to the taxpayer portal on it. So some of them you might have heard, some of them got in and they got their trans their TCC code, their transmitter code, basically that they need that generally takes 45 days. They got them and they started. So some did, but not a lot from my understanding. But again, this is kind of the first year that we're, they'll probably be seeing it that uh, they can apply for them. So uh, you can key in the information to create a 1099. You can upload a a CSV file in terms of the template the IRS provides. You can download and print the 1099, say create it to the recipients, and you can electronically submit the 1099s by hitting submit button. You can file corrected 1099s. You can file extension. So it's an in-house one, no charge basically on it here that you can do. Um, you've got to get the information the transmitter code basically from IRS that takes 45 days. The, you can only transmit 100 per update basically per submission. So I could have multiple submissions, but in the future, we've got a system A2A basically on it. That's gonna allow you to go the bulk process here if you have that loaded. So it's going to be kind of more and more uh, functioning here in terms of that. It talks about that the Taxpayer First Act is what authorized the IRS to set up a website. So some people think, why can't IRS do this? Well, first of all, they need funding and they have to be authorized by IRS to do things. Um, and they were authorized to set up this website and they were they had money to do that so that it's modeled after the business service online suites provided by SSA. So if you're aware of that, this is very much modeled after that basically on it here. Um, and it talks about here, some additional amounts here, maintain a record, prepare and file. So that's the legislative language that was in the taxpayer first act of section 2102 on that bill. Um, here's where it is basically current capabilities on that platform. Um, uh, you can create a user profile support automatic extension, prepare those 1099s, 
um, store up and submitted data internally at IRS, review form data, corrected ones. So a lot of ways that it can be done basically on it. Again, it's a secure access digital identity. They must authenticate by a one-time two-factor authentication. Uh, users will need to create an e-services account to access IRIS and in terms of the external service authorization in terms of that, uh, it's similar, the application is similar to transcript delivery system, fire affordable care, air act and so forth. Here is the 1099s that are provided. You can see there's a lot of them, a wealth of them. Of course, the ones you see most common are basically gonna be the 1099 NEC, the non-employee compensation, or the 1099 miscellaneous. And those are there, the 1099K, the payment card there. So there's a lot of good and 1099R. So there's a lot of good ones that can be done, the 5498. A lot of good information returns. Now you can see here later releases, they're gonna have uh, ACA forms, FATCA forms, K1s, uh, FinCEN information returns. So it's just beginning, it's just starting, but you can see they're going to kind of enhance it basically more for, uh, for more information that can be transmitted through the IRIS system. Again, here's the submission area talks about here, a little detail. I'll leave that too, um, that you can review basically on it, gives you some additional information on it. But again, A2A is that interface, interface that allow bulk ones to more than 100 per transmission on it. Here's the publications where you wanna find the information and here's the link. The publication is 57.7 Iris, uh, portal basically 5718 talks about that a2a specification for the bulk of filing more than 100 5719 information returns uh, so you can go on iris.gov and put those publications number and you can review them there's also websites basically here that provides additional information no problem you would obviously say www.irs.gov forward slash iris basically in terms of that and it talks about the a2a uh, application again basically here and it talks about uh, there's a website that provides an overview of the three different intake channels that we have the fire the air which is for your uh, in terms of if you have insurance, basically in terms of those forms that are sent uh, to the employee and IRIS on it again. I want to talk about National Tax Security Awareness Week. Always be careful of uh, what's happening out there. We have seen so many uh, areas that the scammers are trying to get information here, whether they call, whether they email, whatever they do. We have a National Security Awareness Week. That's this week. And maybe you got through the organization that you allowed some information on it, but you can go to our website. It talks about here just to be careful. And I would always say, maybe if your client comes in, is to just have some a link there in terms of IRS, just be careful. IRS usually sends out letters before they talk to you. That's a generally, we don't email, we don't usually call. It's always a letter first in terms of that. So you wanna be always careful of giving your information. They can spoof numbers, all kinds of things. So you wanna be very careful on letting your information on it. And it tells you some things here in terms of that. Uh, shop on secured sites, make sure that update your security software update. Uh, many people tell me they got personal security software that they pay for and they pay and they update on it. We get updates to our computers that we see periodically. All are helpful, strong passwords, multi-factor authentication. Be sure you do that, especially if you're in a remote location in terms of that. So it has uh, information here on shopping online. It talks about uh, written information security plan on it. We had a webinar on it. You can go to irisvideos.gov uh, basically on it. It will be archived 
um, in about three weeks after November 30th, basically on it here. Um, it talks about publication 5708. I've said some fr uh, firms have said, well, where can I get this? Well, there's a publication that has information on creating a written information security plan. And we had a webinar November 30th, but all webinars the IRS does, subject matter experts basically on it. It's archived to IRS videos basically after that. You don't get credit but it's good information here in terms of that. So always make sure you're on a secure platform basically on it. I always check to make sure I make connection uh, remotely that I'm on the IRS web here basically. I've got my VPN, uh, all things that you make sure that you have proper with your authentication, all the things you want to make sure that you do to protect you as best you can here. Beware of phishing and impersonating schemes basically on it. Um, there's information on it. Again, identif identification theft central on irs.gov. So you, you as a practitioner want to make sure you're protecting that customer data. One thing I mentioned is you get an IPIN or special number for transmitting your return because maybe you voluntarily requested or maybe you had some identity theft. So when you as practitioner file that return for them, put it on at the last moment before that transmit. Some people, uh, practitioners, they said, well, I had the IPIN in there basically, and it still was, uh, it was hacked into basically. Well, that file was there. It had that number on there before you transmit it. So use that at the last minute if people have that, or if a number of your clients have that, put it on at the last minute before you transmit it because they wouldn't know the scammers if it's right in there just before you transmit it. So that would give you additional uh, coverage here. Just want to talk about Inflation Reduction Act, IRA basically on it here. And I just want to highlight kind of briefly the information I gave you is a lot of information and it's good to refer to that. Um, so I won't cover it all in detail, but I want to put some tips in here that I think it's helpful. Again, there's a clean vehicle tax credit. Basically, those are the code sections in there for new vehicles or if they were purchased later, basically on it here, previously owned vehicle. There's commercial vehicle in terms of that. There's requirements that dealers and sellers have to do. And there's resources on irs.gov forward slash clean vehicle. So there's a wealth of information. One practitioner said, he had people come to them about clean vehicles, asked a lot of questions, and he said there was a lot of information on iris.gov, these publications, a lot out there uh, to assist the practitioner and people to see if they really qualify for them. So use the resources. That's what we do. We get questions. We elevate. We try to get those information back on frequently asked questions so you can review those I get a lot of questions on them. A lot of times I do a cut and paste right from them. I said, it's from this link and it's from this question. And here's the answer to you. Again, $7,500 if they buy a qualified electric vehicle, meaning it qualifies basically in terms of that. Um, they change the rules again uh, from, uh, change the rules from 2023 to 2032. So if they don't take the electronic vehicle or the new clean vehicle credit right away, they still got time basically. And it's gonna be in there to 2032, unless it's got changed basically on it. So it's a credit. And as we know, a credit is a dollar for dollar reduction if this qualifies here, but, you know, as we know, it has to meet the criteria. And some of it is, it's gotta be for their own use, not for resale, primarily in the US. So basically it's their own use on it. We look at modified adjusted gross income. So if I'm a married couple, I have to be under that 300,000 head of household 225 or other filers namely single or married finally separate of 150,000. So they can use their modified adjusted gross income for the year they take delivery of this electric vehicle or clean vehicle or the year before which has whichever is less. If the income is below the threshold for one of the two years, they can claim the credit. So it's kind of a nice 
uh, thing there is somebody's income went up way up, but the previous year was in this adjusted income limitation. They can do that. Again, the qualified vehicle, that's a technical term purchased in 2023 or after. It's got a battery capacity of at least six kilowatt hours, have a gross vehicle weight of not of less than 14,000 pounds made by a qualified manufacturer, undergo final assembly in North America. That could be Mexico, that could be Canada, that could be the United States. So it kind of gets kind of complex because now we're talking about battery capacity. And for me, I'm not so sure I know much about battery capacity, but we have some tools here that can help you in terms of, but it has to qualify. Here's what I really like is this website, basically, www.fueleconomy.gov. A list of eligible clean vehicles may be found at the federal government website. So if I had a client or as a taxpayer, I'd go there. I'd see what kind of vehicle I'm thinking about buying, basically, put that information in there and I put I put that uh, I tried that just for my own information I put in a vehicle that I probably won't purchase but I just say does it qualify or not it was kind of interesting to go to so a lot of times we have the IRS will have some sites that you can go to that will find additional information so yes it's an IRS credit but again we have additional resources on it here um yeah, so the qualifies if they buy the vehicle new, the seller's going to reap uh, if the seller's reports are required information and they've been getting information out to there in terms of those and the sellers are required to report the buyer's name and taxpayer identification number, the TIN number to the IRS to be eligible. So you see what's happening. They're matching this information. It's kind of like the dealer sending out the information in terms of that. Does this qualify? And it's going to be impacting that, be probably on the ta uh, taxpayer's account uh, that this information, if they do. If we know the income, it's got to be a qualified vehicle. It's got to meet that. It's got to be uh, made in a certain one. Income, 80000 for vans, sports, utilities, and pickups. They can't exceed that. 55000 for other vehicles. So I've seen people, <clears throat> very high income, saying, well, I'm going to go get that. I said, well, that's your option, but you want to make sure there's modified adjusted gross income. There's limits on these cars, so you want to be aware of that, that you might not get your credit. Now, it excludes destination fees. If there's add-ons, basically, by the dealer in-house, those are excluded, basically. But the MSRP is a retail price suggested by the manufacturer, including the options, accessories installed by the manufacturer. So... That's important on it here. Again, it talks about whether it's a vehicle, um, confirm whether a vehicle is a van, see these uh, links basically, check line if a specified vehicle meets the requirement for final assembly. You can go to the Department of Energy on that. So again, some links use the VIN decoder tool under specific location based on VIN. So there's some additional tools. Again, the regulations were published in the Federal Register on April 18th, basically, in terms of that. Again, they also look at critical mineral in terms of the battery, basically, in terms of that. It's a factor in the credit here, basically, in terms of that. Here's what the employer, uh, not the employer, but here's where the new clean vehicles that are purchased, that the seller is going to provide the information uh, the name and the taxpayer identification number of the taxpayer, uh, the VIN number, battery capacity, verification that the taxpayer original use, name and taxpayer identification number of the seller, the date of the sales and sales price, maximum credit allowed for sales after, the amount of transfer credit if it applies, and a declaration under perjury from the seller. So you can see the seller must provide this information in terms of that. So we're going to have some kind of match going on it. How do you claim the credit? The form is 8936, basically, in terms of that. To claim the new clean vehicle placed in service in 2023, you're going to need the vehicle's VIN, along with a make, model, model year, and placed in service date. So again... Uh, here's previously one basically on it here. You've got to be the an individual owner bought for use. 
not be the original owner, not claimed as a dependent, and not have claimed any other previously clean vehicle on it if you had purchased from somebody else. Your modified adjusted gross income is roughly half basically for that situation. And to qualify, you've got to meet these criteria. The sales price is lower basically. Uh, you have to have a gross vehicle weight of 14,000, primarily used in the United States. Can't use it, use it in a foreign country. That's not gonna work because that's not what the idea on it here. Again, it qualifies for this kind of this purchase from the dealer, got a purchase from the dealer, not an independent party for this secondhand kind of, or this lower amount on it that you purchase. Again, the required information it talks about, it's gotta be sent out from these sales in terms of you claim the credit, previously owned vehicles, 8936 basically. There also is commercial vehicles on it here. And it talks about that 45W on the code. Again, talks about here 15% of the tax basis and the incremental cost of the vehicle, the lesser of on it. So again, businesses and, and tax exempt qualify for this accredit here. Um, again, uh, the vehicle's gotta be a motor vehicle for purpose of Clean Air Act or mobile machinery on it here in terms of, talks about more detail here in terms of if you have the claim and here's where you talk about updates basically. It again is on the form 8936 basically on it here and some criteria. Here's a wealth of information publications you can look at in terms of that. Just one to uh, credits, the residential one, 30% credit up to a, 50, a 1200 annual credit uh, for energy improvements residential energy expenditures made during the year and home energy audits. They have to meet special criteria, also a 30% credit. Now we used to have that per year limit. Now it's per year, basically. It used to be, once you took that limit, you're done. Now it's per year, basically on it here. But you can see there's credits here. Talks about the doors, windows, and insulation, qualified energy. Energy audits have to be done by a certain certain uh, uh, qualified auditor and made suggestions and heat pumps and boilers, boilers and stoves included. Again, a 2000 maximum for the heat pumps, stoves and boilers, uh, 1200 for those building envelopes, uh, central air, water heaters, furnace and boilers, home energy audit. So you could have potential credit at 3,200 again. Uh, talks about the energy efficient. It's on the 5695. And with that, I'm just about right at my time here. So is there any questions showing up there, uh, Ron? Yeah, no, I don't see any questions in the chat. Anyone anyone have any questions for Alan? Just type them in the chat. And so I'd encourage you to use my website or I'll use my email. And this is a good PowerPoint that has a lot of good information if you're not aware of all those details. And I always go on the frequently asked question. Keep on IRS website on these clean energies. That's a wealth of information for you as a preparer or a taxpayer. Our next uh, presenter is Rob Holcomb. He's with the uh, University of Minnesota Extension. Uh, he's an educator out of Marshall, Minnesota. And... Um, He's uh, been doing that for quite a few years. Uh, he he does the he does the Minnesota Tax Schools that he started in uh, in 2010, and he's also on the committee that works with the IRS, a national committee with other extension professionals uh, on on uh, on uh, on setting up the uh, Farmers Tax Guide, Publication 225. So that's always uh, always uh, a, a good thing to to note. And so with that. I will turn it over to Rob. You've got uh, one hour from now until 2.45. All right. Well, thanks Thanks a lot, Ron. Appreciate that. And uh, uh, I'm, I won't belabor the issues here. I'm just going to go ahead and dive right into this thing because when uh, when Ron contacted me, we talked about potential topics and everything. And, and uh, you know, I, I probably got an hour and a half worth of slides. So, uh, so some of this we're going to have to run through pretty fast, but but there were some topics that I thought were were very good to talk about. Uh, my standard, uh, this is kind of one of my standard uh, uh, disclaimers that I use with uh, you know, especially with my with with the farmer workshops that we do. You know, I'm always encouraging uh, you know the 
the, for, for the producers on the call today, make sure that you're a good consumer of uh, professional services. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the ones that the, the calls that I get and, and I get, I get a bunch of calls because, uh, you know, I have an, I have a 100% extension appointment. My contact information is plastered all over the website and, uh, I get those occasional calls and it usually starts off with, uh, by the way, I'm doing my own return. And, uh, and I, I kind of go, well, okay. Uh, you know, I've very rarely ever picked one of those up where, where there wasn't problems with it. Uh, the stuff where I'm pulling my information from here, uh, of course, that you know, some some of this is coming from the IRS website, but uh, a couple of the other uh, things that I'm affiliated with, uh, Land Grant University Tax Education Foundation, or as we the acronym goes, Lagudif. Uh, now, Lagudif is made up of 30 land grant universities, and that puts out that Lagudif puts out the textbooks that we use for our tax courses. Uh, the RuralTax.org. Uh, also known as the Publication 225 Committee, Ron, Ron mentioned that earlier. The uh, you know that that's that's a website. Uh, it's actually hosted by Utah State University and uh, RuralTax.org. I mean, we post. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of really nice material out there. Especially, I mean, there just now recently there was a lot of beginning farmer stuff that's posted on that website. So, so just be aware that there's information out there that, uh, that, uh, we can look at now in the amount of time that I've got with you here today, uh, I wanted to spend a fair amount of time on this corporate transparency act, which is the, the beneficial ownership reporting, which is going to start in 2024. Alan can't talk about that because that's, Part, uh, the, you know, it's it's part of Treasury, but it's not part of IRS, and we'll get more to that when uh, when we get there. But uh, I want to talk just a little bit about soil fertility. I'm I'm kind of glad I added that in there because I've I've had two I've, I had two fresh contacts this week where uh, you know what's happening is uh, when a farmer buys a piece of property, there are promoters out there right now that uh, will contact. The farmer and I, I, they're they're what they're doing is they're they're trying to convince the farmer that they can they can uh, do soil tests and somehow determine that they have excess fertility in that ground and take it as it take it as a deduction. And uh, my comments on that are I I believe that there's a possibility where that type of a dedu deduction can be taken. But I think the window is very, very narrow on uh, on situations where it's going to work, and we'll we'll get more into that when we get here. Now, I've also over the last couple of years uh, worked with. Uh, uh, most of you are going to remember in you know passage of Inflation Reduction Act. All right, Inflation Reduction Act provided some some uh, debt forgiveness, or rather, at first they were ad hoc payments for financially stressed for distressed producers, and uh, those were originally done as ad hoc payments. We had a real major uh, 180 degree turnaround by Treasury uh, back in March on the treatment of those situations. So if you have anybody in your book of business that, that had any of this debt forgiveness, you know, I wanna give you just a brief update on that. I wanna talk a little bit about some expiring provisions that, uh, that are gonna affect everybody. And then I wanna wrap it, wrap it up with uh, just some, some review, real brief review on what to look at for fall tax planning. So uh, let's start off with this Corporate Transparency Act. And, and uh, there's, there's a lot of slides in my presentation, and uh, and and I'm glad that Ron posted that because I'm, I'm probably not going to take a lot of time on a lot of those. But it's got uh, you know that if you if you uh, download those the, that presentation, it's going to give you some additional information that you can use as a reference down the road. The whole idea of this uh, uh, beneficial ownership reporting is really to combat money laundering. Is is what it is. Uh, take shell companies out of hiding. Uh, you know we've got the public law uh, pieces here to this, but uh, but essentially all it's doing is it's it it you know we're putting some additional reporting requirements on certain types of business entities 
to uh, to try and eliminate uh, the money laundering piece that that could be going on out there. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, this program is not going to be administered by IRS. It's administered by FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. It's part of Treasury, but it's not part of IRS. Uh, when when we had uh, you know Alan Alan often you know Alan and uh, one of his colleagues uh, oftentimes uh, teaches helps teach some of our day one of our of our income tax short course and when I talked to Alan earlier when we were planning the course you know he was not authorized to talk about this because it's not part it's not part of uh, not part of IRS so. Uh, they did, FinCEN did issue some final regs in September of last year. And according to the books right now, everything goes into effect January 1, 2024. Now, in a, in a nutshell, let me just, and first of all, before we light up the chat on this thing, let me get, if, if everybody would just hold on, let me get, let me get through this discussion. I promise I will pause at the end and we'll we'll address we'll address some of the uh some of the issues uh, surrounding this now to my understanding uh this is not an annual filing thing that has to happen what 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 who who is affected by this is anybody that has a business entity that had to go to the state secretary of state in order for filing right which is going to include any of your you know, single member LLC has to go to Secretary of State LLCs, any type of limited liability partnership, S Corp, C Corps, uh, anything where you got to go to the Secretary of State. That's essentially what's going to be on the hook for uh, for this reporting purposes. Now, the timeline that we have right now that we that uh, that that we've been told is if you have a client that has a, uh, an, a business entity that's going to be on the hook for this. If the entity existed before January 1, 2024, you've got the whole 2024 to report. You got, you got till January 1, 2025 to do your report. All right. So, so for entities that are already in existence on January 1, you got a whole year to take care of it. Now, for somebody that creates an entity in 2024, okay, you got 30 days from the creation of that entity uh, to uh, to do the report. You know, and the, and the 30 days the 30 days starts from that point in time that you that you actually create the entity. Now, we did we did day two of the short course yesterday for the University of Minnesota, and I did have somebody in the chat yesterday was saying that FinCEN was changing some of these threshold dates. But now I did some snooping around this morning when I got to the office because I knew I was doing this talk. I can't find anything on the FinCEN website that uh, that's that's doing that, but the website might not have been updated yet. I I get uh, you know I have a couple of subscription services. I always get a ton of emails on Friday mornings to to kind of update me on the week stuff. So you know maybe something will show up here tomorrow, but I'm I'm going to stick with my 30 days uh, on this until until uh, somebody tells me otherwise. But uh, but bo bottom line is, uh, you know, the the uh, reporting requirements are are pretty much pretty straightforward on this thing. So, what we need to do here, you know, this is going to affect domestic companies uh, that that you know we're going to have to deal with, and and essentially it's that it's that uh, entity that the entity had to go to the Secretary of State for filing. So it's going to be your LLCs, any type of limited liability partnership. Uh, S Corp, C Corps. It's also going to include those uh, those single member LLCs as well. They're a disregarded entity, but they still have to go to the Secretary of State for the filing. Now, here's a chart that gives you, you know, that just kind of sums up who's on the hook and who's not. So you'll see that a general partnership is no, sole proprietorship is no, unless these folks have done the check the box option to get taxed as a corporation. Right. If they did that, then they are on the hook uh, for that. So uh, so so largely, you know, I, I always try to get things as simple as possible when uh, when doing this. Now, 
we taught this extensively in our ag tax course back in October. And I guess in our ag tax, ag, ag tax textbook, we had an extensive list of uh, 23 different types of entities that were going to be exempt from this. My, the, our, our comment during the ag school was, uh, the exemptions on this are not going to affect very many people. So if you're hoping to uh, to find a lot of exemptions where where your folks are not going to have to file this thing, uh, good luck. I, I just don't think that's uh, that's going to be the case. You know, accounting firms are exempt only if they're uh, you know uh, registered with the Public Accounting Oversight Board or you got over five million dollars worth of gross receipts. And the thing is. Once you get that big, you've got other reporting requirements anyway. So, uh, so it, it's it's not that big of a deal. Uh, already talked about the deadlines for the uh, for for filing these reports, and uh, you know, plus uh, you know, the, but 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 again, my understanding of this is that the, this report is not something that's going to have to be filed annually. It's something that you file. And you don't have to update it until circumstances change to where you need to update the information. All right. And, and there could be a number of things along those lines, primarily the company changing structure or possibly some, uh, some uh, beneficial members that change in the organization. Uh, if you've got a death of a beneficial owner, the uh, timeline on that uh, starts at the time that the estate is settled. Uh, and, uh, let's see. Yeah, we've already talked about that. Uh, now what has to be reported, uh, of course, full, full, full legal name of the, uh, of the business or doing business as address, uh, plus any tax ID numbers that, uh, that are going in here as well. Now, the other thing that currently what's, what's on the books for this thing is this bottom bullet that you find here. And uh, you are going to have to have a scan or a picture of a driver's license or a passport or some type of approved uh, identification for all the beneficial owners. All right. And, uh, and, and uh, that number changing on the driver's license would warrant having to update the, uh, the document. Now, I don't know about North Dakota, but now in Minnesota, when I get in, when I get my driver's license renewed, my driver's license number doesn't change. All right, my driver's license number stays. I just, you know, it just, I just go get a new driver's license, and they, they take a new ugly picture of me, and and uh, you know, I get a new one for another four years. So, uh, so uh, you know, we we just drive on with that. But but if if you got a state where the number changes every year that they issue a new driver's license, that's going to trigger having to refile this thing. All right. Uh, already talked about this app. You know when this has to happen. Okay. So another question I'm sure in everybody's mind is who is a beneficial owner? All right. There, those are the folks that have substantial control in one of the entities that we talked about uh, earlier. All right. And that's defined essentially by if they have more 25% or more of a controlling interest in that in that uh, company. All right. So. You got a bunch of people with 10% interest. You don't have to worry about it. It's it's that 25% that seems to be the threshold in the uh, in the the stuff. Now, uh, you know more more material, but I think the main thing that to to watch for on that is the 25% uh, the 25% rule. I am not one to stand here and uh, and beat on the desk and say, oh, you got to do this. Uh, there's all kinds of penalties out there, folks. You can see what you can see what's going on here. Five hundred dollars a day or ten grand. You know, they are put some teeth into the uh, into the uh, uh, into the into the penalties that come out here. And, you know, they actually start listing jail time if you know if you're flagrantly in uh, in uh, arrears on this thing now i do not want anyone to uh walk away from this thing and say that well rob said they're going to kick the can down the road on this thing that's not what i'm saying uh you know fincen has requested that this be delayed the implementation of this be delayed but uh, we have no word on that or anything yet. 
So, so, uh, I, I think, I think the prudent thing for everyone to do right now is when you meet with clients in the fall, inform, you know, it's real easy to earmark the ones that are going to be affected by this. What you need to do is you need to let them know this is something, this is some additional filing we're going to have to do during 2024, get them up to snuff on the thing. And this is probably one of those summer projects that happens after we get beyond filing deadline. And uh, so I, th I think, I think what, what we need to do right now is educate everybody and let everybody know this is something that's coming uh, down the road. If it if the can gets gets kicked down the road, well, the can gets kicked down the road. But but as of right now, I think we got a plan on doing it. Now, uh, more resources on this. Uh, the uh, if, if folks, this is an awful link uh, in in the material. I you know what what I've done since I made this slide set up is if you just go to a Google search engine and you type in FinCEN beneficial ownership reporting, it'll take you right to the site where all this stuff is. Uh, and it's, and there's, there's all sorts of, I've, I looked at it this morning. Uh, there's, there's Q and a it's, it's, it's really fairly well laid out uh, as far as where the information is located. Now they also have put out a, uh, a uh, small entity compliance guide and that's posted on this uh, FinCEN website. And that link, that link that I have up here, that is a good link. Uh, that 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 was just recently updated. But what the what the uh, compliance guide is is going to be doing is it uh, you know it has the updated it has the updated FAQs in there. Uh, it's supposedly written in easy to read language, answers key questions has checklists, infographics, and other tools to kind of assist you with, uh, with compliance issues. Now, just a, just a couple of, uh, of uh, pulling together notes on this thing. You can't access this site yet. I, I confirmed that this morning when I looked at the website first thing when I came in here to the office. The, uh, the, the site is supposed to open up January 1. And uh, you you will have to register as a as a preparer in order to in order to to go in there and do these reports. We don't know what any of this stuff is going to look like uh, as of yet. But uh, but just to recap the main things, you know, my understanding is that uh, that this is a uh, you know you file the thing and you don't have to worry about filing the thing again unless something changes with the company, uh, like an owner or uh, you know, an owner or uh, that ID number. The you know, that the other thing I read was that that if that driver's license number changes and you upload that, that triggers having to refile the uh, the paperwork on that. So uh, let me just open up the chat here real quick and see whether we've got anything. Yeah, Rob, you got a you got a question there. Uh, you can see. Uh, uh, on the and the fin sim, did you see that question? Yeah, I'm 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 open. I'm kind of scrolling the thing up here so I can see. Okay, all right. So yeah, this is what was reported yesterday. I just haven't had official word on this. What what changed, folks? Uh, this this is confirming what I heard yesterday. The uh, okay, going going back. I'm I'm not. Uh, let's just back up to the. What this is telling us is that is changing is um, this uh, where you know if something changes if you create a new entity you got 30 days to to do the filing that's now going to be changed to 90. All right, so that that was re that was actually reported yesterday. Uh, so that's that's where that's where that's going. So I, I think, I think that kind of confirms that, but I, I still like to kind of get that stuff from my reporting sources early. So I think that's the, yeah. And I agree. The ad, you know, there's a comment here, ad, address change triggers refile. I agree. You know, anything changing with the, uh, anything changing with the, uh, with the company in general. All right. Uh, I anticipated that was going to burn up a little bit of time, and it did. So uh, let's let's uh, drive on here. The the other thing I don't want to talk too long about this, 
but uh, on this residual soil fertility issue, let's let's just kind of talk about this a little bit now. Now, Ron, Ron, and I haven't talked about this, but this is something that really is almost getting out of hand here in Minnesota. I don't know about North Dakota, but uh, th this is this is a issue that's been around for several years. What what the whole idea is, folks, is uh, somebody along the lines concocted this idea that when you buy a piece of property, you could have soil tests done on that on that ground, and if you can determine that there's excess fertility in that ground, you can take that as a deduction at the time of the that you purchase the ground. All right now. That's somewhat convoluted, but the but what's complicating things is, is that we've got promoters, and I kind of put these into the same category as the ERC promoters that are out there, uh, you know, contacting your clients and and saying, oh, you you know, they, they're contacting your client and saying, oh, you you can get all this free money, and uh, you know, kind of whether you qualify or not, uh, you know, I've I have. I haven't had a lot of these that I've seen where they're really doing a lot of due diligence on this thing. But, uh, you know, my, my, my understanding and my interpretation of this pretty much surrounds around this uh, circles around this, this technical advice memorandum from 1992. Now, this is really about the only guidance that we have to go on this. I, I have, I have stood, uh, I have, been in the meeting with IRS in Washington, D.C., and we've talked about this issue, and I flat out said in the nation's capital that the best thing that could happen is we need a, we need a court case on this thing so that we get some guidance on, on how to handle this thing. Now, what the TAM says in order for this to work is you got to be able to establish the present and extent of the fertilizer. So if unless somebody did soil tests at the very beginning when they when they bought this property, I, I I think it's a I think it's a dead issue. I mean, if you don't have any soil tests and somebody calls up and says, "Oh, we can go back and we can retroactively create this," no, you can't. Uh, you need soil tests at the time that the transaction occurred. The uh, you need to show that that soil fertility level was attributable to the previous owner, and the only way you can do that is doing a soil test at the time of purchase. All right. You need to be able to show, based on the soil tests, that uh, that the ground has an increased or higher than normal level of fertility. All right. Now you're going to have to contract with an agronomist on that. I'm I'm farm management. I am not an agronomist. Uh, most of our most of our land grant universities are going to have uh, soil scientists that can that can kind of examine that and they can they can provide some guidance as to whether you know what's a what's a normal level of fertility in that regard. But what you have to show is you have to show that you have more than normal fertility in the ground. And number four, which I think is the hardest one to, to prove, is you have to provide evidence indicating the period over which that fertility is going to be exhausted. Now, the way I read this, folks, is uh, I interpret this as the equivalent of a depletion deduction, meaning that you're just the fact that you have extra fertility in that ground doesn't guarantee you of a, of a, of a deduction you need to be able to show that those fertility levels are going down to treat it as a depletion deduction in order to get the, in order to be able to deduct it. Now, here's the problem, all right? And I've seen this over and over and over again. Farmer buys a piece of property, promoter contacts these people. They do, you know, they, they write up all the paperwork and they say, oh yeah, we got extra fertility. We got extra fertility. We got extra fertility. Folks, what's the first thing that they're going to prepay in the fall that they, the year that they bought this stuff? All right, they're going to claim that they have excess fertility, but they're going to go and put more fertilizer on there as a prepaid expense. Now, uh, Minnesota Department of Revenue has been very aggressive in auditing these things. And, and that, that cir circumstance that I just described is, is one of the more common ones that, that they'll throw the thing out. 
uh, and, and, and frankly, you know, un, under those circumstances, you know, I'd really, uh, without, without some additional guidance, uh, coming in from, from, uh, internal revenue, I've, I've really got a lot of problems with, with, uh, with folks, you know, paying a promoter and taking this deduction. And, and one other thing that I also want to point out, I'm not trying to scare anybody on this, but, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I occasionally, We'll get contacted by IRS uh, and largely because I have a reputation of looking at an issue and evaluating an issue in a fair and unbiased manner. Uh, this is on IRS's radar. I've been asked to participate in a couple of uh, in a couple of calls with uh, with with uh, IRS staff at the national level. And this is. This is now on the radar, so so I I'm telling everybody, kind of be careful with this one. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't be doing this unless you really got your ducks in a row. And uh, you know, in my opinion, I think you need to have more than one soil test, and you need to be able to show that those fertility levels are going down. If you got that situation, then I think it's a slam dunk, and I don't think anybody's going to be able to argue with you about that. But uh, but if you just do one soil test. And just and just amortize portion a portion of that purchase price out there. Uh, I don't think you got much of a leg to stand on. Now uh, that's that's enough for Rob soapbox on that thing. Uh, I don't see anything in the chat box, so I'm going to go ahead and drive on here uh, on this now, uh, real quickly because I do understand that this is probably not going to affect a lot of folks on the call here, but at least I want to make you aware of what's going on with this thing in case in case you happen to encounter this. The uh, you know under Inflation Reduction Act, we did there was a provision where uh, folks that had uh, that were delinquent on FSA loans. Uh, were going to get some. Uh, they were going to get some debt relief. Now the debt relief was going to be in the manner of ad hoc payments, and those ad hoc payments showed up on a 1099G. They were reported. They were reported as a farm program payment, and it had to get reported on uh, on Schedule F. And it was. It turned out to be taxable income. Right. That's the way these were originally treated and i've got a picture of the 1099g uh also there would have been a there would have been a a 1098 that came in there because there was there was uh, some interest split out when those when those payments were made now the whole impact of this folks was the the average for the debt relief that occurred nationwide i think the average payment was like $70,000 so and most of these were smaller operations so you have a smaller operation and all of a sudden you drop 70 grand into their into their lap and make it a taxable payment it was it was going to cause you know some tax planning uh issues that uh, that had to happen. So one of the efforts that I had educationally last year was, uh, you know, I did I did some national webinars, just kind of trying to trying to educate some of these smaller producers because a lot of them, let's face facts, we're not the best record keepers in the world. We are trying to, you know, let them know, all right, you know, you need to do something to help mitigate this. Otherwise, uh, you know, you're going to have a substantial tax bill on this thing. So uh, here's Okay, that that ran along all of 2022 up till uh, we got into March of this year. All right, then all of a sudden, my email box starts lighting up. Well, here's what happened: Treasury and IRS through you know with nego through negotiations with Farm Service Agency, they did a complete 180 on this thing. Rather than the the folks that had the folks that had direct loans, uh, the uh, they were you know the, the, the these were for direct loan borrowers. Uh, they the ones that had received the ad hoc payments that had been reported on 1099G. What they did is they did a 180, and then they decided, all right, we're gonna we're gonna change this. We're gonna issue corrected 1099Gs with zero dollars. And we're going to issue 1099Cs and report it as cancellation of debt. All right. This all showed up about March. 
of uh, you know mid middle of March of this year, and some folks had already filed returns. Other returns were in the process and everything, and it really created a mess. All right, so what what we ended up with is we ended up with with new forms, and uh, and and this this is from the producer webinar, folks. I know you know most of most of this group's going to know what a what uh, what the corrected box and where the ag payments are are reported, and and the 1099C is going to show that amount of that amount of debt that was discharged. So the the whole issue here is and and I don't want this to turn into a too big of a discussion on cancellation of debt but remember with the cancellation of debt uh you've got to reduce tax attributes you know we can we can get out of reporting that income either through insolvency or qualified farm indebtedness so odds are between those two things you know we're going to we're going to at least qualify for being able to if if we have some uh, some tax attributes that we can reduce. Now, remember that means you know if they've got an NOL, we got to reduce the NOL. We need to reduce business credits, or we need to reduce uh, basis and assets. All right, and if they don't have any of that stuff to reduce, it doesn't do you any good. I mean, with without without the reduction of the tax attributes, that cancellation of debt's going to show up as taxable income, just like it did on on the 1099G. So, uh, so, so for some folks that this affected, it really didn't help them out that much. Uh, now the, uh, okay, we already talked about that. So here's kind of the rubber hits the road part of this. All right. If they already filed the 2022 return and then all this paperwork showed up, they need to look, they need to, they need, producer needs to sit down with the tax preparer and determine, all right, is Changing this for cancellation to debt going to do us any good? If if they reported it at all as farm income and the cancellation of debt form showed up and it's not going to do them any good because they don't have any tax attributes to absorb it, uh, they can just leave the return. Uh, they can just leave the return the way it is. IRS is aware of this issue. They don't have to file an amended return. They file an amended return if it does them some good to to take it as cancellation of debt. All right. So uh, the other thing worth noting is that if they had this cancellation of debt, they are still producers are still eligible for USD loans and programs. All right. So that's that's a key, key element to this. Um, OK, let me look here at this. Uh, soil fertility creates ordinary income for seller and the amount of claim for purchase. Yes. The, uh, Mr. Erwick uh Key point here is that uh, you know if they're doing this soil fertility, it's a good idea for this to be in the purchase agreement, so the seller is treating as ordinary income, and uh, that makes it a lot better to uh, that makes it a lot better on the uh, on the other side. Uh, order there there is an order for reduction of tax attributes, and and I would have to look that up to give you the exact amount. But but if you look at the uh, if you look at the uh, cancellation of debt forms, it pretty much has that on there. But yes, there is a there is an order on that. All right, let's move into sunset sunset items here, and uh, okay. One second here. And I'm looking at the clock, and I got to kind of, I got to crank here. Um, now, stuff that changed in 2022, uh, that's stuff that's already in the books. So let's just let's let's kind of skip over that. Uh, now, these are these are provisions that are set to expire at the end of 2025. Remember, this is stuff that's going to expire that go off the books for the, uh, you know, this, this was all from the tax cuts and jobs act. So once we get, once we get to 2026, those lower individual tax rates and also the, you know, thresholds for all those are, are going back to the old rates index for inflation. So, uh, you know, stand, you know, our standard deduction is going to go away. You know, we go, we go back down that increased child tax credit goes away. We lose QBI once we get to 20, 20, uh, 2026, uh, plus the, uh, you know, the employer provided meals, uh, personal exemptions return, the salt limit ends, uh, home mortgage deduction in, you know, 
limit increases and we get uh, miscellaneous itemized deductions back. Now, the stuff that's permanent out of this that, uh, you know, don't want to get anybody's hopes up. Uh, there's no provision in here for like kind exchanges for real for uh, personal property is is still going to, uh, you know, we're still going to be we're still going to have to do uh, sales and purchases for machinery trades. All right. So, you know, like kind exchanges are, are still going to be only for real property. Uh, vehicle depreciation list, those stay on here. The NOL restrictions, uh, cash accounting, and the depreciation rules for farm machinery, that all stays the same, all right, in that regard. Now, uh, real quickly, want to talk about QBI here for just a moment. I sh actually should have had a – should, and this is slightly out of order. I, I moved – I pulled the QBI slides ahead of tax planning because that's kind of where they belonged. But uh, now on QBI, we only have QBI through 2025. It goes away in 2026 unless somebody changes something legislatively. On uh, There's two different deductions. There's the 199 cap A small a. That's just the 20% of, of, uh, of uh, business income or qualified business income. Uh, that, that gets reported on the return. That's, you know, it does not reduce self-employment tax, but it shows up as a deduction. All right. There's also the 199 cap A small G. Now that's kind of the equivalent of the old D pad credit that comes through from co-ops. And uh, it's now reported on the 1099 as 199 cap A small G. It's, it's the pass through QBI that, uh, that the farmer gets if the co-op decides to pass that through and the co-op board has to elect to, to, to do that pass through. It's not an, it's not an automatic type of thing. Now, the, uh, the, there, there are thresholds where you start to lose uh, QBI once you go above those uh, thresholds at the bottom of the slide. And if you go above the threshold, then you got to, you got to have uh, wages and uh, basis and assets in order to to get a QBI, so it, it it's it's a little more calculation if you've got a high income earner on this thing. Now, this is the discussion I wanted to remind everybody. Don't forget, there's a reduction deduction uh, if you if you've got a client that's doing business with a co-op. You have to do a reduction of the Q. You've got to reduce the QBI by either nine percent of the QBI. Uh, 9% of the QBI attributable to the uh, co-op sales or 50% of the W-2 wages allocatable to the, to the co-op sales. All right. Now, the, the key element to this is, is if the farmer doesn't have any wages, if they're not paying any W-2 wages, then there's no reduction. All right. Because it's the lesser of those two. And if you, if you got no wages, well, the, the lesser of zero is zero. So, uh, so that, that's the simple way of looking at that. Um, so just, that's just a quick reminder on that. Um, oh yes, correct. Yeah. That, well, that, that was actually never adjusted for, for tax cuts and jobs act. Never messed, never messed with, uh, the maximum for 179 anyway. So, uh, okay. Good, 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 good point. Well taken <laughs> point. Well taken. Okay. Let's drive on here. Um, this is a chart that I have used for oh probably close to twenty years. Uh, I kind of stole it from a stole it from a previous uh, stole it from a previous colleague, and I just noticed ha, I, this doesn't have the twenty twenty three chart in here. But uh, anyhow, it gives you it give, this gives you the rough idea here. Um, the uh, I've got a version of this where I've got the twenty twenty three rates in here, which uh, the whole idea of this is, is, uh, you know, looking at this, uh, this is something that I typically print off for, uh, for clients when I'm sitting down doing tax planning. And uh, it's a good visualization of what's happening with the rates. Now, this assumes that uh, all the income is farm income, but but it still does a nice job of explaining everything. The blue line is just your income tax rates. You got a 10, 12, and this is all married filing joint, 10, 10 12, 22. 
And then uh, the orange dotted line is your self-employment tax running at 15.3%. Out to uh, you know, and this year we're out to about 160,000, where it jump where it drops down to the to the 2.8, but you pay the 2.8 out to infinity for uh, for business income. And the green line is just adding everything up. So this doesn't take into account state income tax or or uh, you know state income tax or NID or anything like that. It's just basically showing you when when you sit down with a client. And you uh, add up all the income, add up all the expenses before you start looking at accelerated depreciation and prepayments. You know, if you got somebody that's uh, get my let me get my pointer fired up here. Uh, you know, if you got somebody that's out here in the middle of the green hump, well, that's that's a pretty high that's a pretty high rate. All right, you know, they're you know we're we're, we're getting we're getting pretty close to uh, you know th- you know thirty seven thirty eight percent out here. And uh, so, you know, if you get somebody here, I I normally like to spend more time and pay more attention to the rate than I do looking at the total dollars. All right. And and because, uh, you know, if somebody is here and we want to prepay them down to here. Well, essentially, there's they're saving about 37 cents on the dollar for everything they prepay from here down to here. Now, if they're prepaying from here down to here, it's not, they're not saving as much per dollar that they're prepaying on that thing. Are they reducing their tax bill? Absolutely. But, uh, you know, is that the most efficient way to, uh, to, to look at that? Uh, that, that's, that's probably a, you know, different group that needs to look at that. Um, on the tax planning strategies, just kind of looking, I got about 15 minutes left here. On uh, on the tax planning strategies, you know, we'll talk a little bit about prepaying expenses, income averaging, deferring income, accelerated depreciation, and crop insurance deferral. So that's that's what I've got here for the left for the remaining portion here. Now on prepayments, uh, the the general rule of thumb on prepayments is that you can uh, you know you can prepay stuff that you're going to be using for next year. The thing is is that you can't it it needs to you know, what you're paying for can extend, the benefit of it can't extend beyond either 12 months or the end of the following tax year. All right. So the example I've got on the slide here, somebody in November is paying a one-year insurance premium in November. No problem deducting that in November because it only goes for 12 months, you know, and it's it, it's either going for 12 months or before the end of the following year. The other thing worth noting here as well is uh you know, I've, I've always, uh, you know, I always tell everybody, you know, if they're trying to generate expense and everything, go to the bank and make sure that you pay up all your accrued interest. You can't prepay interest, but you can pay up your, all your, all of your accrued interest. So, you know, that's, that's one thing I always send, send folks off to, to take care of. Now, the general rule on prepayments is if you look at the schedule F, including depreciation on the expense side you just you know you're looking at total expense chop that number in half and that's what you're allowed to prepay all right the uh now you there is a mulligan rule for those of you those of you that are golfers out there uh the the mulligan rule allows you you know kind of let you get by with with uh messing that up one time uh, but you have to be a farm-related taxpayer. Now, the farm-related taxpayer is pretty much defined in the farmer's tax guide. You got to be a, you know, taxpayer's main home has to be on the farm, principal red, principal business is farming, or they got to be a member of the taxpayer's family that's part of the farm family farming operation. So so if, if that's going on and you haven't gone over that limit in the last three years, you can't exceed the 50% for one year. Now, I always am real careful to try and, make sure that we don't go over that 50% limit because, uh, you know, I just don't want to be flirting with that. Now on prepays, this is by far the most important slide that I'm going to share with you. Uh, good review. Prepayments, you got to have a payment. You got you actually have to be buying something. All right. You can't just go to the co-op and put money on account. Uh, I've, I've had folks, you know, when I was with the association, they'd come in, they'd hand me the They'd hand me the co-op statement, and it would say right there, money on account. In fact, they were getting paid interest for, uh, you know, for for having that money on account. I mean, that's not going to fly as a uh, as a prepayment. Now, we've got a business reason for doing this. 
uh, oftentimes producers are going to get discounts for buying stuff in the fall. So, so you know, we're, we're fixing price and we're also assuring ourselves of the supply. So, uh, you know, so we've got good business reasons for doing this. The, the, the IRS guidelines in Pub 225 and in the Treasury regs, it does tell us that we can't materially distort income. But if we're prepaying every year and it's part of our normal business practice, we're not, we're not materially distorting income in that regard. All right, income averaging. Let's look at the, uh, okay, can a farm, can a startup farmer first year prepay expense in 2023 and take a deduction in 2023? I probably wouldn't, okay, I'm assuming that they're starting in 2024. They're going to generate an NOL in 2023. I'd probably stay away from that. I mean, you, you, if you want to flirt with that one, that's fine. But I probably would avoid that. I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna generate an NOL if you're, if you're doing that. Uh, income averaging uh, filed on Schedule J. Now, uh, Schedule J is the income averaging form, and what uh, in, in IRS by their own by their own admission is going to uh, say that this is an underutilized form. All right. Now the whole idea of this is is that uh, you can only do Schedule J for farm income. It has to it has to be farm income. It doesn't affect self employment tax and it doesn't affect taxable income. All it's changing is the rates. All right. So here's an example where this would work out okay. Uh, let's say, for instance, we've got, you know, we, we, what we do is we look at the three prior years. Now, this line right here is supposed to symbolize the top of the, the top of the 12% bracket. Now, I realize from year to year that that top is going gonna, is gonna to notch up a little bit due to inflation uh, adjustments that we get every year in the brackets. But you know, for, 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 for simplicity purposes, I've just got it as a straight line right now. Now, the point is, is that we had unused 12% bracket here, here, and here. All right. Now let's say we got whopping income here in 2023. What we can do is we have to put, put an equal amount back into the prior three years. You can't load up one year and de and lower amounts in the other two. You have to put an equal amount into the prior three years. So what we're doing is we're taking some of this 22% money and we're putting it back into these prior years and taking advantage of those unused brackets. All right. So that's the whole idea of income averaging. So, uh, but it's done on schedule A. Uh, some software does a better job of analyzing that than other software. But but it but it nevertheless is uh, you know is a you know it's it, it's it's a powerful thing. It isn't going to reduce self employment tax. All it's doing is it's really blending your rates. But it definitely can help help on that uh, tax liability. Okay, crop and livestock deferrals. Let's talk here just a minute, just a little bit on this. Uh, you know, I'm in the short rows and I'm under ten minutes here, so I got to hustle. Um, all, all we're talking about when we're doing livestock to, or, crop, or crop deferrals, all we're doing is we're just postponing sales into the next year. Now, I want to clearly, I want to clearly differentiate between just deferring sales and doing a deferred payment contract. Those are two completely different things. All right. Now, if if uh, if you've got somebody that uh, that, that that could you know, they just forward contract something and they're going to sell, they're going to sell grain in February. Well, that's just, you know, it's going to be a cash sale in February and it's not going to be income for the, for the current year. Now, of course, this doesn't work for accrual basis filers. We're only talking cash, uh, but, but we got to, you got to be conscious of those constructive receipt rules. You can't go to the co-op, run the, run the uh, truck of grain across the elevator and then just tell them to hold the check. All right. That doesn't work. That's that's constructive receipt of income. You're going to have to take that as income at that at that time. Now, a deferred payment contract. That is when you enter into a contract with the buyer that says I'm transferring the ownership of this commodity, but I'm not going to get paid. You know, normally this time of the year, I'd have I'd have the contract where I'm not going to get paid till like the first week of January. 
All right, so I'm deferring, and those are allowed under the installment pay, under the installment method rules. So, so that is that is perfectly allowable to do that. My one cautionary note that uh, that I issued everybody on on a, on an annual basis is that when you do do deferred sales under a deferred sales contract, you are an unsecured creditor. Meaning that if something happens financially to that business that you entered into that contract with, you're the last person that's going to get paid out of the bankruptcy court. All right. So, so just be aware of that, that that's the risk involved in these deferred, in these deferred payment contracts. Now, I'm guessing that we've got some folks that these, uh, you know, weather related livestock sales, this is going to affect. And uh, the reason I say that is we had widespread drought all across the region uh, this last year. And uh, some of these provisions require a federal disaster declaration. Others do not. So let me just touch on the, the, two, the two categories with related to breeding livestock. Now, this is going to, for, for North Dakota folks, this is going to, you know, 99% of the time, it's, this is going to be affecting a, a cow-calf producer. All right. So you got a cow calf producer. They got it. They got a they got a herd of, of uh, mama cows. They know they probably have a normal cull rate that they have on their herd. All right. Now, if you were in an extreme drought area, no hay, no grass, and the producer ended up selling a higher amount of breeding stock in a given year than what they normally would because they didn't have feed that qualifies under the the breeding stock deferral all right it's uh you know you 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 uh you actually can postpone the uh tax on the sale of those breeding livestock now you do have to turn around you got to buy them back inside of a two-year period of time uh but uh, but what you can do by doing that is you can postpone uh having to report the sales of those things now that's under that's under a 1033 Deferral is what that is uh, to to give you the uh, to give you the code section on that. Now you don't have to have a disaster declaration to defer those breeding stock animals. Now on the raised animals, okay, let's talk raised animals here. Now this would be in the cow calf case. This would be the calves. All right. Say I have a normal uh, marketing uh, pattern of selling a certain number of calves every year. All right, maybe I'm you know selling a certain number of calves. The other ones I'm holding back to for yearling weight. Uh, you know, due to weather-related circumstances, no feed, no grass, et cetera, et cetera. I sold a higher percentage of my calves in any given year than what I normally would have done. All right, that's deferrable under uh, Code 451. But uh, the difference is is that I've got to have a federal disaster declaration either in my county or an adjacent county in order to be able to do that. All right. So now on these defer on this on these uh, livestock deferrals, what I would encourage you to do is if you're needing more information on that, check out the ruraltax.org website. There's really good facts. There's a really good fact sheet on uh, on those posted there, and that, that's where I, that's the first place I would send you on that. Uh, last thing that I've got here uh, before I, uh, in my last three minutes here, is this deferral of crop insurance. All right. Now, crop insurance, um, I'm anticipating with the, with the drought situations that we had this last year, I'm anticipating that we're going to have a lot of producers that are going to get some crop insurance payments. And uh, we want to talk about how to handle this thing. Now, on uh, crop insurance, you have to show, you know, you you have to be reporting on cash basis. So somebody that's doing accrual, sorry, you're out of luck. Uh, but uh, you need to establish under normal business practices that you would have normally sold those crops the following year. Now, on the crop insurance, one other point, one other key point to remember is you cannot defer revenue. All right. Most producers nowadays are buying these hybrid uh, policies where it covers damage and destruction and it also uh, has a guaranteed revenue portion of it right if they're getting a payment on if they're getting a payment based on revenue guarantee and not damage and destruction that revenue portion is not deferrable under any circumstances 
All right. So, so note, note that the, uh, here's the, there's a revenue ruling from 74 plus is supported by a Nelson court case in 2008. But, but what this is showing or what this tells us is that, uh, crop insurance deferral. And I do not agree with this interpretation, but this is the, this is the way it gets enforced. The, uh, on crop insurance deferrals, you need to look at each commodity, All right? So if you got a client that's growing corn, beans, and wheat, you need to look at the corn sales. Are they normally selling over half the corn the following year? Then you look at the beans. Are they normally selling over half the beans the following year? Same thing with the wheat. If they're, if they're selling over half of all the commodities, looking at them each individually into the next year, then you're eligible for the crop insurance deferral, but it's all or none. All right. If you're, you got one of those commodities where they're selling it out of the field, it poisons the well and, and you're not eligible for any deferrals. All right. I, I, I do not agree with that interpretation, but that's, that's the, that's the rules that we're, that we're living with right now on that. Okay. Uh, folks, there is, the thank you. There's my contact information. And Ron, according to what I'm looking at here, I got one minute. So uh, uh, I, I went through some of that pretty darn fast. I don't see any questions. Uh, you answered questions kind of on the fly there, but I don't see any questions in the chat for you right now. So Okay. All right. Well, and folks, I'll hang on. I'm planning on being on here till four o'clock. So if something else comes up, I'll, uh, you know, I'll be, I'll be happy to chime in in the, in the chat on that and uh and everything but there's my contact information the only thing i would say about uh contacting me this time of the year i travel a lot so uh you know i i would recommend email try try an email first don't you know there's there's a lot more days i'm going to be out of the office than this next month than what i'm going to be in so email is probably a better option so, is, thank you. Now we're we're looks like our technology is working. I want to introduce uh, we're pr our our North Dakota Tax Commissioner. We're pr privileged to have him speak today. Uh, he was recently elected to his uh, to office in 2022, but prior to that, he was the Public Service Commissioner in North Dakota, and uh, and he wears many hats as the in the department, uh, the tax department in North Dakota. I, property taxes, uh, sales taxes, and he's got his income tax hat on today. And he and he's gonna talk a little bit about some of the changes that happened to North Dakota taxes. All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity, good to be here. And and it's been been an interesting discussion so far. I love the, the previous two presentations. But just as a, an overview, uh, in the 30 minutes that I have allotted, we'll cover the uh, past legislative session that was the 67th legislative uh, assembly that gathered and they left at the end of April. I uh, did show up briefly to do some corrective work here uh, just a little bit ago, but uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, the session is wrapped up and things are going or had either gone into effect or they continue to go into effect, bills that pass. Uh, did pass. Uh, I'm going to touch also on House Bill 1158. That was the overarching uh, tax relief package that lawmakers uh, really grappled with for quite a bit of the uh, uh, quite quite uh, extensive amount of time during the session. So a lot of conversation surrounding that. Uh, we'll touch on some tax incentives for ag businesses, and uh, that really has two different types of. Uh, of benefit, it helps incentivize business, but it also uh, hopefully opens up some new, new opportunities for our ag producers in the state, as well. And uh, we'll talk just uh, ever so briefly on the motor fuel refund and, and a few do's and don'ts on that to keep in mind. But with that, uh, talking about the legislative recap, and again, these are these are some highlights, if you will, related to uh, our area uh, of responsibility. And and I should add that uh, we are an administrator of tax law in the state. Uh, our job is to administer, enforce statute, uh, and do the collection work on behalf of the citizens, and then. 
uh, we are the primary collection mechanism for the state of North Dakota, not exclusively, but uh, approximately 90% of North Dakota revenue uh, that is needed to operate, or we produce about, I shouldn't say produce, but we collect about 90% of, of what is used to sustain the budget from biennium to biennium. So uh, quite a lot of ground for us to cover, as was mentioned. But uh, on the sales and use tax side, uh, there were two two areas that I think are worth talking about. One was a renewable REITs, uh, renewable feedstock refinery area. And then the other was sustainable aviation fuel facility uh, refining renewable feedstock. And they were, they were very similar in nature, uh, but there were just some subtle differences to the two, and I'll explain those on the next slide here. Uh, House Bill 1430 was the first that was used to uh, provide an exemption, uh, an incentive for the construction of a renewable feedstock refinery. Uh, it could also involve an expansion of an existing facility uh, and an upgrade, an environmental upgrade, uh, again, to an existing facility. So. Uh, fair, fairly broad in nature, uh, but also very specific in terms of uh, who might be able to, you know, which entities might be able to take advantage of the exemption. And uh, one that does come to mind would be the Marathon Refinery out in Dickinson. Uh, they would qualify, uh, both having, uh, having the capacity, the nameplate capacity to fall within statute as being eligible, and also the type of... Uh, type of work that they're going to do and product that they'll be producing going forward as they switch over to biodiesel. Uh, that was an important bill for producers. And as mentioned, it uh, could certainly incentivize uh, different types of ag practices and production practices in the state from types of crops raised, et cetera. Uh, and then the other, so that you know, we're talking about that as a renewable feedstock refinery. Then another very similar, frankly, uh, piece of legislation that passed in a different bill. Uh, it was a part of Senate Bill 2006. And that was also a sales and use tax exemption for materials used to construct, expand, or upgrade. Uh, again, a facility that refines renewable feedstock. And uh, these can amount to quite a bit in terms of savings, but it helps to incentivize industry. That's how lawmakers looked at it. And again, as mentioned, we uh, just during the legislative process itself, as as a point of reference, we're not uh, we're not uh, creating bill drafts. We're not proposing legislation as a rule, unless it's more of a housekeeping type mechanism. Uh, but we serve as a resource for lawmakers when they're entertaining these types of bills, considering them for passage. Uh, we're, we're right at the uh, right in the thick of it. We're producing fiscal notes, estimates on what it might mean uh, financially for the state. And uh, if, if it's a reduction in revenue, uh, we provide those types of projections so lawmakers know what's the cost. Uh, but that's, that's one of our primary roles. And then the other is to make sure that it's worded correctly, that we can administer it effectively. And that uh, can be a bit challenging, uh, but it's something that our legal team works on virtually nonstop from the beginning to end of session. But those two, uh, both renewable feedstock uh, refinery type bills, one was uh, related to the biodiesel type products, and the other was uh, for sustainable aviation fuel. So some differences, caveats uh, in the two, uh, but really the same, same, uh, same approach and same intent. Uh, again, in terms of the legislative changes, I had mentioned uh, the income tax relief package, and not as a part of that uh, was the automation reenactment and changes. And really what that bill did uh, was making it more agricultural, uh, more agriculture friendly, if you will. It, it wasn't specific to agriculture, but they did include that language to talk about 
uh, ag processing, ag manufacturing. And again, that has a ripple effect to the individual taxpayer in terms of uh, more efficient plants in the state uh, can certainly have an impact on agricultural practices. And, and we see that uh, with when you think of uh, the Richardson ethanol plant and the amount of corn that's grown uh, in that part of the world now versus how much uh, was grown, you know, going back uh, you know, 20, 25 years ago, it wasn't exactly known as corn country. So that combined with as producers know, improved genetics, uh, drought resistant varieties, things of that nature uh, really, really reshape the ag, ag landscape in the state. Uh, the automation credit, uh, it's more, again, industry oriented, uh, but that provided an, an income tax credit that was uh, tied to the cost of equipment purchase to to automate uh, the manufacturing processes of plants in the state. And that, again, includes ag uh, or animal agriculture processing as well. And then the automation credit changes, just a few of the caveats uh, to that uh, include uh, a tax credit increase uh, that went from 15 to 20 percent uh, for qualifying equipment. So a little a little uh, more lucrative from that standpoint, uh, increased the maximum tax credits to, uh, in aggregate, $3 million per year. Uh, if claims or requests for those credits exceed $3 million, we prorate those uh, accordingly. And then $500,000 in credits is reserved for first-time claimants. So uh, one thing that I, that I found interesting when we're talking about automation credits, uh, that type of thing, uh, when we talk about value-added agriculture in the state, uh, it's easy to think about the larger plants, the, the crushing plants. Uh, the, uh, uh, any type of large commercial scale value-added uh, uh, in the state, but Ag also continues to change as well in terms of uh, who's eligible and who's taking advantage uh, of these types of programs. And uh, even on, on a smaller scale, uh, large from a farm size standpoint, uh, we do continue to see more and more activity with producers looking at ways to uh, not just drop it at the elevator, but to uh, enhance the value and uh, sell it from a retail uh, sell it at the, on the retail level. So uh, these types of things uh, will become more uh, more a part of the conversation, I think, going forward just for uh, farming units in the state uh, themselves. And not and it's not uh, even though often tied to uh, large commercial scale operators, uh, not necessarily the case. Uh, House Bill 1158, that was the that was the tax bill I was talking about, the, the large tax relief package. Uh, I think we ran several hundred uh, different scenarios in, in terms of combinations of uh, uh, weighted relief in you know, the property tax area, the income tax area, uh, and, and several others. And lawmakers were just trying to find a formula that kept everyone reasonably happy so they could get the votes necessary to pass uh, some type of legislation, which they did. And 1158 was a landmark type bill. It was the largest, uh, for example, income tax relief package in state history. Uh, quite substantial uh, in, that effect, in that respect. And, and uh, then the balance of the bill, uh, still con a considerable amount, about 40%, uh, was related to property tax relief uh, through the homestead tax credit was one mechanism as a part of that. And then, then uh, the primary residence credit was another component in that. And when you're thinking of farming, you might think, well, a homestead credit, that's for someone who lives in town. Uh, the primary residence credit would be the same. But uh, as we know, uh, quite a number of farmers, uh, they don't always live on the farm itself, uh, you know, on the farming unit. Uh, they might live in town and then they hop in the uh, truck in the morning and they drive out to the uh, 
uh, the farmstead, the shop that they, they happen to live in town. So uh, these are still incentives that quite a number can take advantage of. And then those who do live on, on the farm, and I'll touch on this in a little bit, uh, there's the farmstead exemption as well. So they're not under, uh, they don't have a tax obligation uh, if that farmstead is a part of a farming unit. But House Bill 1158, it was uh, quite a wrestling match with lawmakers in terms of what the final formula would look like. Uh, just touching on this real quickly, uh, in terms of the tax brackets, North Dakota, even prior to this, had very low income tax levels. Um, but what House Bill 1158 really did was eliminate the first bracket in terms of having any type of tax rate attached to it. Prior to passage of 1158, the tax rate on the first bracket was 1.1%. And then overall, we had five tax brackets with the top bracket being 2.9%. Those five brackets were consolidated into three. Uh, again, the first bracket at 0%. And then you can see, depending on the filing status, uh, how the other rates would uh, play out. But, uh, you know, for for every income earner in the state, when I when we look at uh, from the, the lower income earners to the upper income earners, uh, they all travel through the brackets. Uh, some only get some don't get beyond the first bracket, but they still saw relief. Some get to the second bracket, some get to the third, et cetera. Uh, so proportionately, uh, the relief uh, would follow depending on how far someone would get through the bracket system. But uh, North Dakota did prior to passage of 1158. We already had the lowest income tax uh, rates in the state for states that have income tax. Uh, there are uh, some states that don't. We were the lowest and now we uh, just uh, went down a little bit more, but it was uh, one of the reasons lawmakers went this way is it was broad based relief. Not everyone owns a home. Uh, six out of 10 North Dakotans do, but almost four out of 10 don't. So the income tax mechanism was a way to reach those individuals, the renters as well. Uh, the homestead credit, I touched on the two types uh, real quickly. That's, uh, that was expanded. Uh, income was up to 42,000 prior to 1158 in terms of uh, the threshold that moved to 70,000. Uh, it can't exceed that but it did open the uh, open things up for a number of new applicants. Uh, the 65 years and older, that was the same. Uh, and then the permanent uh, or having a permanent or total disability, uh, that remained the same. That was an existing statute. It was really about the threshold being raised and simplifying the formula a little bit. But again, for our ag producers that aren't uh, living on the farm, uh, but actively farming, they just happen to live in town, they can take advantage of this as well. And then the primary residence credit, uh, that's a straight $500 up to $500 tax credit that is applied to a property tax statement. Again, that would, uh, this would be for those individuals, uh, as mentioned, farming, but not living on the farm, living in town. And, and again, there's a, there are a fair number of individuals like that. Uh, and it seems to, I don't know if it's a growing trend, but it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, component when you think of our farmers and our, you know, crop farmers, our livestock producers, they're not necessarily uh, out on the farm, out on the ranch anymore. Uh, the tax incentives for business, uh, just real quickly, uh, this is a slide we use quite a bit. Uh, again, we've got very low income tax rates, zero to 2.5%. Uh, the corporate income tax rates as well, uh, very attractive at 1.41 to 4.31. Uh, our pass-through entities, partnerships, S-corps, they don't pay income tax. That goes down to the individual uh, level, of course. Uh, North Dakota exempts all personal property from taxation. Uh, so no taxes on things like office equipment, inventory, uh, accounts receivable. Uh, some states do go that route, and it's, uh, I think it creates a lot of paperwork, so I'm glad we don't, we don't have that in place. Uh, we have affordable workers' comp, unemployment, uh, insurance tax rates. 
And just as, you know, moving along, uh, just watching the time here, uh, this is how North Dakota ranks <clears throat> from an overall taxing standpoint. And our collective tax rate, when you look at sales and use tax, income tax, excise tax, uh, on a per capita basis, uh, when you look at it that way, and, and what's, what's the overall rate, it's 8.8% is our effective rate. Uh, so really, uh, when you're looking at this map, the, the darker shaded states are the, at the highest. Uh, they're the highest. And uh, lighter is better from a taxation standpoint. So North Dakota is very competitive. Uh, and here is our ranking overall. And this, this is interesting. When you look at a state, uh, we're, we rank seventh. And it will ebb and flow a little bit, but we're consistently in the uh, top 10 for lowest rates uh, in a good way. And you think of a state like South Dakota at 8.4%, uh, they don't have income tax. So they're a no income tax state, but really not a lot of change in terms uh, or difference between North Dakota and South Dakota. The impression might be that, that uh, it would be significantly more, but I thought I think that's always an interesting comparison to point out. And it, it, and again, it ties back to the different taxing mechanisms. Uh, if you don't have income tax, you're probably going to have higher sales tax, higher excise tax, uh, taxes in other areas. So uh, overall, we're uh, amongst the best. Alaska really stands out, but a uh, very small population and a, and a high, and Wyoming follows suit. Uh, sparsely populated, uh, large geographic area, and oil and gas reserves. Uh, our ag exemptions are, they include uh, the 10 things listed from commercial fertilizer to tank cleaners, foam uh, marker, uh, and uh, additives, uh, you know, during the chemical application process, whether it's herbicide, fungicide, uh, insecticide, uh, feeds, um, seed, etc. So those are all tax exempt in the state of North Dakota. Uh, and uh, lawmakers are always talking about uh, other things that they might be able to exempt. And typically, uh, those those proposals come from our rural lawmakers, and they're working on behalf of their constituents, uh, especially when they're predominantly uh, in an ag producing county and that's that's their primary business sector, which, you know, for all intents and purposes, it is in just about uh, every county in North Dakota, we have somewhere energy uh, might trump uh, ag receipts, but, but uh, overall lawmakers are looking uh, out for our producers. And uh, the sales tax rate in North Dakota, as I think everyone knows, the state sales tax rate is 5% uh, for most retail sales. Uh, new farm machinery uh, is at 3%, and then used farm machinery, that is not subject to sales tax. And one of the differentiating factors in terms of what is new versus what is used, uh, if it's been taxed once, uh, and then resold, it goes into the use category as a rule. Uh, or if it's, uh, uh, it comes in from out of state and that uh, prior state had taxed it and then it makes its way across our border, uh, that is also exempt. Uh, and that rate is three, per, well, again, that, that rate would be 0% on the use side. And for new, it's at 3%. Um, just on a, on a side note, it's something we constantly look at in terms of providing more clarity uh, to both producers and our ag businesses alike in terms of how those tax rates work. So we're always open to suggestions in that area. Uh, and then sales tax incentives uh, also include those for ag commodity processing plants. I had touched on that earlier on the renewable refinery side of the equation. Uh, North Dakota does have incentives for uh, sales and use tax on construction materials, having those as uh, an exempt area, and that's beneficial for driving new industry in the state. 
uh, more sales tax incentives related to this would be uh, a tax credit, an income tax credit, uh, an investment credit for processing facilities, so a little different way of going about it, but in general, uh, the, same, the same approach. Uh, taxpayers are allowed an income tax credit in the state if they invest in a qualified ag processing or ag uh, commodity, I should say processing facility as certified by the North Dakota Department uh, of Commerce. Uh, that's a part of their division, uh, a function of the Division of Economic Development and Finance for them, and uh, constantly looking for ways to help, help uh, uh, incentivize new development. And that is uh, uh, the credit itself is equal to 30% of the investment. Uh, there is a limit, uh, up to $50,000 in credits for any year, and unused credits they can carry forward for up to 10 years, uh, but there is a maximum overall in this particular area for taxpayers, no more than $250,000 for credits for all of the tax years combined. And then also there is another uh, incentive that is a one, uh, one for fertilizer chemical processing facilities in the state. And uh, as it states that is might or it can be granted, may be granted for purchasing personal property. Uh, again, tied to construction of a chemical or fertilizer processing facility. And quite, quite a bit of conversation related to that, uh, even in this past special session uh, in terms of the fertilizer processing facility. Uh, so there is that tax incentive that is out there. And again, that, uh, this doesn't tie back uh, directly to the individual producer, but from a cost standpoint, if we can, we can uh, expand um, and create uh, more access as a state for products like fertilizer, really good for our, for our ag community. Uh, I'm going to just kind of move past this. I see I'm getting down to the last few minutes, but uh, this is a similar incentive. Again, tax exemption on machinery and equipment used to uh, support manufacturing and agricultural processing uh, in particular. There are also property tax exem exemptions, and I touched on this a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, I had mentioned the, I brought up the example of, of a producer living in town, eligible potentially for the homestead tax credit, uh, depending on their income level, uh, also eligible for the primary residence credit. But uh, the second bullet point in this is what I had already referred to, that uh, something that is a part of a farm unit. And as a rule, it has to be uh, not only a part of the, the farming unit, but uh, 10 or more contiguous acres. Uh, there are some, some criteria, uh, as you might expect as a part of that, but that farmstead can be exempt. And ag processors, uh, they can also be granted a partial or even a full exemption that is up to five uh, additional years uh, to help them get off the ground as well. So uh, a couple of property tax incentives that are out there for uh, both producers and processors alike. And then there, this was, uh, uh, this was uh, also something that uh, was a part of this past legislative uh, session, uh, and at least a part of this. You have the workforce recruitment credit that's out there. Uh, that is someone who contracts with a professional recruiter uh, for a fee. Uh, they provide employment information on a website, uh, pay of signing bonuses, moving expenses. Essentially, how do we incentivize people to apply for jobs and come to North Dakota to work to help help uh, ease our workforce shortage? Uh, we have some challenges in that respect. And then the internship employment credit as well. Uh, and that uh, is for an internship program in North Dakota and that can certainly tie back to agriculture. I uh, talked a little bit about the motor fuel tax. Uh, the, the normal rate uh, outside of agriculture for motor vehicle fuel tax, the state rate is 23 cents a gallon. 
The special fuel tax rate is also 23 cents a gallon. Uh, but then when we get into dyed diesel fuel, uh, biodiesel, kerosene, but you know, when you think of North Dakota agriculture, you're going to be thinking about uh, diesel in particular, uh, that's taxed at four cents. Uh, if, they, if a producer does pay 23 cents a gallon, if it's used, fuel used for agricultural purposes, uh, they can apply for a refund. We handle quite a few of those. And uh, one thing I had brought up, kind of some do's and don'ts. Uh, one thing that is a don't is uh, for producers, uh, it's not putting the dyed fuel in their, their diesel pickup and running that up and down the highway. That, that isn't something that uh, is considered agricultural use, even if they're running for parts. Uh, once you're on the highway system, uh, uh, you wanna make sure that you're using uh, highway diesel and not, not dyed fuel. So the uh, eligible pieces of machinery, we've got tractors, swathers, uh, combines, as you might expect, uh, powering augers, uh, et cetera. And, and again, also as mentioned, uh, non-eligible is pickups, trucks, cars, uh, the things that would be more, more non-ag related, even though uh, an ATV, for example, uh, could certainly be considered for ag use. And then uh, just on the refund front, I'll close this out really quick. Uh, we did issue 550 refunds uh, for those who uh, didn't uh, you know, start with the four cent tax and paid the 23 instead and over 400 and you know, almost a half a million gallons of fuel tied to that. And then one final piece is uh, uh, we encourage our taxpayers out there, businesses, individuals alike, to utilize the North Dakota uh, TAP, uh, which is Taxpayer Assistance Point, uh, as we move you know, into the digital future, if you will. Uh, we continue to work on this. It's effective. Uh, 93, 94% of individual income tax filers file electronically. Uh, uh, businesses uh, are in that 90 plus percent range as well. And, and this is one of the portals that we offer for businesses in particular in terms of filing electronically. And then finally, uh, don't be afraid to tell us uh, how we did, what you'd like to uh, hear more about, uh, changes for future presentations or any questions you might have. There is my contact information and I'd be more than happy to visit. Well, thank you, Brian. I see you have one question in the chat here. Uh, why does North Dakota still have personal property tax on manufactured homes? Personal property tax on manufactured homes. Um, I would actually, you know what, I'd have to, that's one of those things where I'd, I'd have to dig back into statute and, and, uh, you know, what was the intent by lawmakers when that legislation was enacted to begin with, but I'd be more than happy to follow up on that. I, off the top, I don't know the, the history behind it, but it's yeah. an interesting question. Uh, whoever asked that question, you can try contact, uh, contact him uh, directly and see if you can uh, find that, find that out. So. Yeah, yeah, please do. And, and the number I list, and, and I share this publicly, I, I've been, I've been told I'm, uh, crazy for doing this, but um, I think it's really important uh, to be as accessible as possible. Uh, that 701471 number, that's my personal cell phone. Feel free to call me. It's the easiest way to get a hold of me. So whoever posed the question, I uh, look forward to visiting with you and, and I'll do some follow-up and get some answers. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here today. And uh, I would ask if you've got any questions uh, as we're going through the presentation, <clears throat> throw them in the chat and uh, let's uh, see if we can benefit everybody. Uh, I know a lot of you have uh, been on presentations in the past uh, where I've talked, but some of you may be new. So we always like to talk a little bit about what our department does here at Ag Country. These are the six areas we focus on. <clears throat> Uh, not every farm needs all six. Some of them only need a couple. Some need all of them. Uh, so it's just a matter of uh, trying to, uh, you know, kind of create a holistic plan for the farms and address exactly what they need. Next one, Ron. 
This is something we tell people, uh, and it, we see this come to fruition on a regular basis where the, the farms that don't plan, that don't get out in front of things, that don't do a good job tax planning or estate planning or retirement planning, uh, their, their heirs or successors might have to compete with other producers that are. And for those folks that plan, when an opportunity comes along, it seems that they're, they're uh, in a position to more readily take advantage of that opportunity. So next one. So here's today's topics. We're going to talk about updates, what we're seeing out there. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of reviewing, and I'll show you why when we get into it. I'm going to cover estate planning. <clears throat> I will get into transition and retirement planning and talk a little bit uh, about some of the tax tools that we use and some of the things we uh, we encourage our customers to consider. And then, of course, I never, I never get through a, a conversation presentation without talking about communication. Uh, it's it's a vital piece to this whole process. Okay, here's county land values. So we're going to start, and what I'm going to do is tie this into what we're seeing. This chart uh, we put together based on data that comes from our appraisal department. Every June, our appraisers uh, appraise certain parts of our association. Uh, we call it a benchmark survey. So it's the same parcels year in and year out. Uh, some of the parcels are two to three quarters. Some of them are five to six quarters. So it just depends on where we are. But as you can see, uh, this is no surprise to anybody that's been in agriculture for any period of time, uh, just how much uh, increase in value we've seen in, in land. And again, you're not going to see every county there in North Dakota because we don't uh, we don't appraise in every single county uh, for the benchmark survey. Next one, Ron. And of course, you all know about machinery as well. If you're working with producers, we know what's going on. Uh, I've had people call me up and tell me, um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna trade a piece of equipment off. <clears throat> we originally had it. Uh, on our balance sheet for $125,000, and now the implement dealer will give us $150. And so that's those those are common stories, uh, but clearly uh, machinery is a big part of this whole pricing issue. Next one, Ron. So let's talk about some case study. I took my worst ones that I've seen over the last year <clears throat> uh, and put them out here to show you what we're seeing. Now, this is the, the next two slides or the next four slides. This is probably as bad as it gets, but it's still indicative of what we're seeing when it comes to buyouts. Now, when I talk about buyouts, what I'm talking about in, in estate planning documents like a will or a trust is when there's language in there, typically at the second passing of both spouses, where a successor can buy out siblings or buy assets from a trust uh, with, a, with a pricing formula. The pricing formula usually is traced back to the appraised value. So in this case, <clears throat> we have four children. And in, in, in this case, they had a will with stipulations for a farming child to buy out the trust. I think this one was done in 2009. Uh, the parents owned nine quarters. They gave two quarters in the trust to the will to the farming child. And then the remaining seven quarters would go equally, being bought out at 80% of the appraised value by the successor. Land in that area recently sold for $6,500 an acre, um, bringing a total value to about $9.3 million if we use that average. Parents had a nice machinery line. Um, I think they use their machinery to tax plan, but anyway, uh, the two and a half million can also be purchased at two and a half or at eighty percent of value, and then the residue, which is everything that's not specifically listed in the will or trust, <clears throat> went equally between the four children. Next one, Ron. So what this equated to uh, was machinery was the purchase value went to about five point eight two four million. Machinery buyout was at about $2 million. Uh, the good thing here is, is the successor uh, participated in the sale proceeds. Uh, so to buy out the three siblings, when I ran this, these numbers and put them in front of the customer, it was about $4.3 million. Um, the total buyout equates to about five point eight when you throw the land and the machinery together. Based on the, the number, Numbers at the time we, we did this, the interest rate was six and a half. So this is a little aged. Um, 
the purchase price, the payment would have been about $487,000 a year. Okay. Now I remember this will is 14 years old. Second case study deals with an entity that uh, I've worked with uh, and their buy sell agreement was, I believe from the nineties. Uh, they had about everything you could think of in this corporation. So you probably already know it's a C Corp. Uh, machinery and vehicles, building site, beat stock, a bunch of land. <clears throat> this corporation was put together, I think, by their dad in the late 70s. And so, so, again, we continue to see this. And, of course, the houses were in there as well. Next one, Ron. <clears throat> so the total value for the corp estimated to be about eighteen million four eighty three. It had some debt, so net equity was about seventeen six zero seven. Each owner's equity five point eight six nine million dollars. And the buy sell agreement said if the equity exceeds one million for any one owner, uh, it's sold over thirty years using AFR. Under the arrangement, the buyout would have been three hundred sixty thousand three zero eight. So the question we're asking our customers when we do this kind of analysis, is this feasible? Is this something that your farm can support? And of course, everyone's going to say no. Um, and again, we've corrected these. We had action steps, uh, changed the buy-sell agreements. We changed the um, the will for the, the case with the nine quarters. So, But, but the point we're going to make is, as you see me go through the presentation today is review your documents, especially if they're older than five years, and especially if there's buyout provisions in those documents. So what are we doing? How do we approach this? Uh, we, the first thing we do is we, we kind of we run that balance sheet through the will or trust. We just pretend that the second spouse's dies because typically on first passing, not always, but typically <clears throat> all assets would go to the survivor. So we don't have any buyout issues. Uh, but then we run it through, we apply their formulas and the numbers in almost all cases really surprise the customers. They just haven't thought about it and really applied their numbers to it. So that's the first step we do. Then for entities, <clears throat> what we want our customers to do is sit down each year and agree on a value. And if I had you all in a room right now, I'd ask you to raise your hand and, ha and have you tell me how many customers sit down with their, their, their fellow business partners and do that each year. It's a very small number, but for those that do, it just helps them understand if they should be adjusting their buy-sell agreement. The obvious one is to reduce the number of acres and or the number of assets a, su a successor must buy. That's a lot of what people will do. In the case I shared it with you with the nine quarters, son, farming son got five now. And so the other four quarters uh, would have to be bought out, which still is going to be a sizable amount where they live. Um, increased discounts or increase the buyout duration. That's one thing to talk about. Certainly we can look at uh, having them buy some life insurance. Uh, some farms will buy life insurance on, uh, usually it's a second to die. Uh, and at the second passing, the life insurance proceeds would go to their non-farming heirs. The bulk of the farm-related assets would go to the, the successor. <clears throat> We've done this a, a, a number of times. Uh, we'll sell, sell land to the successor now. Start the buyout when that successor is in their 30s or 40s and get it started so they're not faced with a potential buyout when they're in their late 50s or early 60s. Of course, the issue here is this is going to be taxable. Uh, you know, it's not a step up, of course, on a contract, but it's one way to kind of uh, chip away at, at high buyouts. Uh, one thing I've done that this, this one surprises me uh, as to how many people like it, uh, but at the second passing of both parents, we would keep the land and the trust. Maybe not all of it, maybe the home quarter or other key pieces would go to the successor immediately. <clears throat> but then the successor rents the land out of the trust with the rental proceeds going to the non-farming children. And then after a period of time, typically it's been between five to 10 years of time, that trust terminates and the land then goes to the farming successor. Okay? Uh, this is this doesn't always work, especially where, where there's areas where the rents are a little low. So it, it's just one idea that we'll talk to our customers about. 
So if we've got a balance sheet where we've got a lot of non-farm assets, maybe we've got a big retirement account, a home in Arizona, a lake home, uh, we might suggest that we look at leaving all or most of the farm-related assets to the successor and all of the non-farm-related assets to the non-farming children. The risk here is the nursing home. Uh, you know, if all of those liquid assets are in the name of the uh, parents and one of them ends up in a nursing home, those investments, cash, those other securities are going to probably be used to pay for nursing home. So we have to have the conversation about that level of risk. One thing we can do is we can put land in an entity like a limited liability, limited partnership. The two ownership classes uh, in the L triple LP are the general class, which is a controlling class, and then the limited class, which is a non-controlling class. Uh, and then we leave at the second passing of, of mom and dad, we would leave the, the general controlling interests to the uh, farming children. And typically when we structure these, these arrangements, the, the general class is only about 2% of the total ownership. So it's not so much the percentage in this case, but it's the type of ownership that we're leaving to the farming sibling. And then the limited interests, which are the non-controlling interests, could go out equally to the rest of the kids. Uh, a lot of folks like these land entities because we can build buy-sell agreements that restrict ownership to just the, uh, the immediate family and, and their heirs. Uh, the farmer stays in control. They like that because if they need to buy land and use partnership land for collateral, they don't need the permission of their non-farming siblings. Again, these are all very case-specific folks. Not everybody needs the same thing but these are some of the tools we're using. Next one, Ron. All right, here's uh, some recommendations. We could ask this a lot. How often should I look at my will? Well, it depends. Uh, if you've got a successor, we definitely need to look at it at least every three to five years, especially if there's buyout formulas in that will or trust. If we don't have a successor, every five to seven. Uh, sometimes the laws change, and if, if people aren't routinely uh, bringing their documents in for a review, uh, there may be something in the body of their, their will or trust that we can adjust or make a change to, uh, so it just makes things flow better. Maybe they've acquired a property uh, outside of their state. I, I had this happen this morning. They had a will-based estate plan. They just purchased Arizona property. And I had to tell them, you know, at the second passing, you're going to have a probate in Arizona. So we had to make an adjustment uh, in their plan. Buy-sell agreements for entities. Uh, we like to look at those every three to five. Um, again, a lot of it has to do with the formula uh, for, for any type of buyout. But what if you're adding new owners? Uh, we should probably have the new owners uh, sign that document. I mean, they're bound by the terms of the buy-sell agreement when they become owners. But I always like to ensure that they've had an opportunity to look at it and to prove they've had that opportunity. We want them to sign that buy-sell agreement. And then on the larger estates, uh, we need to be planning today for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act sunset. Um, you know, the, the possibility that that exemption is going to go down um, is all over the board. You know, I, I was at a seminar last May and, and the CPA that spoke there uh, said that in order for that law to, to not sunset, we need a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a Republican president. And the circle he runs in suggests that the probability of that happening is about 12.2%. So I don't know where he got his numbers, uh, but uh, that would suggest that um, the sunset is, has a higher pro probability of, uh, some, of uh, happening. One thing, we all know farmers are notorious for, for last minute. I mean, how many of you get your information from them to do tax planning uh, on time? You know, they're busy people, a lot of them. They don't think about this stuff uh, and, they, and they forget. The thing we're worried about is the last sentence there. If everybody waits until 2025, or worse, the latter half of 2025, and it looks like it's going to sunset, are there going to be enough people to do the work to get any kind of transfers or sales that we need done? Um, we don't think so. 
And so that's why we're getting out in front of it with our customers now, especially with these larger estates to start suggesting they start taking some action, like perhaps selling assets, gifting assets, um, getting into some other provisions of the estate plan that, that helps control that estate tax. Next one, Ron. All right, <clears throat> what are we talking about with TCJA? What are we telling our customers? First off, they need to know about it, okay? And Ron did a good job going over what is gonna change in addition to uh, you know, the, the estate tax. You know, the, it impacts the TCJA expiring impacts more than the federal estate tax. But the exemption uh, next year when we go into, um, and I'll, I'm coming up to a slide, it's gonna be higher, but everything gets basically gets cut in half if this thing does sunset. One thing that's really key when we're, when we're doing work for our customers is we've got to use real-time values. <laughs> Balance sheets from loan officers and from producers almost always undervalue the land. And from a credit and lending standpoint, that's, that's healthy. I mean, you, you can't loan based on 100% of market value. You've got a loan on a lower value because if land values go down, the loan is still pretty solid. So estate planning needs to be done using market values. <clears throat> One of the things we're talking to a lot of customers about if, if they're open and inclined to gift is to consider gifting now. Use up some of that unified credit, uh, especially in states where there's a state-to-state -state tax like Minnesota. Use of land entities. Uh, this is one area that we've really ramped up with the larger estates uh, using the triple LPs to own their, their farmland. Generally, what we'll, we'll suggest is let's take a look uh, and have that entity value. Let's see what that thing's worth, not only in terms of its asset value, but take it to a business appraiser and have them appraise it uh, for purposes of the minority marketability discounts. Now, we all know that those M&M discounts have been challenged by the IRS and several other lawmakers in the past, and they would like to repeal them. But the appraisers I work with uh, seem to think that, you know, the case law and the historical perspective will continue to support the, uh, the M&M discounts. But uh, for the larger estates, uh, that's one area where we're looking. I should tell you a lot of the appraisals we've had done over the last year have been in the range between 35 and 40 percent discounts. Uh, and they're, they're supported by, by good material and good data, good research. Um, and the appraisers I talked to as well, I asked them, what are you seeing? You know, are you being hauled into court to justify your appraisal? Most of what I hear from them is for land entities, very little, if any, where the IRS has a lot of angst or triple LPs that own a lot of investment assets, stocks and bonds and those types of things. Uh, so let's, you know, that, these are some of the tools. We'll see where this goes. Hopefully we still have this tool in the future. Next one, Ron. <clears throat> the message we have uh, for our customers is review your docu documents soon, especially if you've got a buyout formula for, uh, for your siblings or if the entity has a buyout. Almost all buy-sell agreements for an entity have buyout provisions. <clears throat> and don't wait. Uh, and like I say, we've been telling our customers, if you wait, you may not get your work done. Um, come in and see us. Let's explore the options. Let's see how you feel about this risk and see what action steps uh, might fit into their plan. Next one, Ron. <clears throat> so here's where this uh, Tax Cuts and Job Act are going. And I think some of you may already know this, but <clears throat> here's our 2023 numbers, our annual gift exclusion, our lifetime exclusion, and that we have for a married couple through portability. 2024, the annual exclusion is going up to 18,000 per person. The lifetime will go up to 13,610 for 27,220 for a married couple. This is where inflation is helping us. <clears throat> um, it's, it's making a difference on the estate tax exemption. So let's see where this goes uh, in 2025. We don't know yet. Again, if we sunset, uh, you'll see 2026, we're back where we started, 1-1 uh, one, one of 18, and then adjusted upward uh, for inflation. And again, it's anybody's guess where this will go if uh, this law does in fact sunset. Next one, Ron. 
A uh, quick word on state of state taxes. I put this slide in here because last time I talked, I got a couple calls from people who, who live in Minnesota but do North Dakota taxes. So I thought I'd throw this in. <clears throat> North Dakota, South Dakota, and we, we work in Wisconsin as well. No estate tax. Minnesota does have, uh, uh, they're decoupled and they do have a state estate tax. Next, Ron. And here's their numbers. Uh, this is an extra uh, estate tax on top of anything that might come from the federal government. Uh, the standard exemption in Minnesota is $3 million. If they have a qualified air farming their land or a qualified small, small business, you can add an additional $2 million to that for a $5 million uh, exemption per person. But Minnesota does not have portability like North Dakota does. You can't port an unused spouse's exemption to the survivor. So we have to be ensuring that there's a disclaimer or bypass trust in there. Next one, Ron. So with the estate plan, one of the first things, you know, we need to know, and we always know this right away, but, you know, if we're going to transfer a farm or ranch through the estate plan to a successor or just transfer assets to no successor, those documents should look different. Um, and why? because equally devised documents, estate wills and trusts no longer work. Um, and we're gonna get into a discussion here in a little bit about the degree of legislation we're seeing and, the, and the, the fights. I mean, that's just really what it is when things go equal and, and uh, people just don't get along and, and agree. Next one, Ron. So during, during your life, again, I always remind people, never forget about uh, durable powers of attorney. Uh, if you've got an older uh, POA that's, say, seven, eight, ten years older, uh, you might want to have that looked at. Uh, the newer powers of attorney are including provisions for digital assets. And our concern is if you've got uh, somebody's cell phone that needs to be <coughs> changed, and they're laying in a nursing home and you walk into Verizon with no POA, will they let you make that change or do something with that phone? Uh, we don't know, but we, uh, we think you stand a better chance with a POA that contains digital language. In both the healthcare and the, and the power of attorney, try to avoid dual successors. Generally speaking, each spouse is a successor for each other. And then we appoint uh, children after that. We're seeing problems with uh, more so the banks. Um, if there's two successors and they're joint, they need to be there together in some banks. Not all, but but, but in some. <clears throat> and, and I've had uh, I have a couple of farmers whose spouses are doctors, and I ask them uh, separate, of course, uh, what do you think about healthcare directive successors? And told them, you know, should it be two or one? And both like immediately. <laughs> said never put two on there because if they disagree, then the doctor and the nurse have to get involved and try to coach them through it and get one to, to bend and, and get on the same side. So quick quick note on nursing. Let's go back to nursing home real quick, Ron. Um, what do we look at doing if they don't have, if they, you know, long-term care insurance? The older policies are really good, but they're getting extremely expensive. We're seeing letters being sent to customers with an offer to buy out the, the uh, um, insured for the amount of money they put in in, in premiums. Those are the lucrative ones. The newer ones are not good. Uh, the newer policy just are very watered down. People can self-pay. We always design. We run cash flow models to see if their, their cash rent, their Social Security, other assets will, will allow them to self-pay. But more so with land, people want that protected. The vast majority of people do not want their family to have to sell their land to pay for a nursing home. So we start looking at life estates and irrevocable trusts and remind them that those assets have to be out of their name for at least five years before they're considered uh, uncountable or, or not something that has to be spent down. So, okay, now we can move ahead, Rob. All right, let's talk about transition and retirement planning. And, and again, I remind everybody uh, in every seminar I do, <clears throat> time is really your friend. I mean, there's so many things that can change financially with health. <clears throat> uh, we think, uh, you know, transition plan five to 10 years, uh, it needs to address everything. 
everything at that farm needs to be touched on and talked about because shifting power is, is what I see is way more difficult than shifting assets and transitioning assets. It's easy to start moving machinery and let your son or daughter buy the, the, the new piece. But when you start shifting power and control and management of that farm, that can be a daunting task for some individuals. It takes time for them to get used to that. Some are better at it than others, but we always want you to, uh, to, to take time. For people that don't have successors that are looking at retirement planning, we like to see three to five years. Uh, do we always get that? No. <laughs> I mean, we'll still help them and get the work done, but the pressure that we put on them to make decisions, especially as it's related to tax, uh, is a little, sometimes a little overwhelming. And so we'd rather get out in front of this, talk about how it works, show them the tools, give them a chance to think about them, uh, you know, two to three years out versus having to have all that done in the year they're going to be done. Um, next one, Ron. <clears throat> All right, transition tools. Let's talk about machinery bins and buildings. Of course, the infrastructure. Obviously, we can sell these assets, but we all know what kind of a tax burden that is. I don't think there's a week that goes by where I have a customer that doesn't say, um, what are the taxes if I sell my son my bin site or if they start uh, taking on you know, the, the feedlot? Leasing. Uh, now, there's two kinds of leasing I'm going to talk about here. The first is leasing with a commercial lease uh, lessor. And this would be if something new comes to the farm. You're gonna put a shop up, add to the bin site. Maybe you're gonna add that second or third combine. And you've got a successor, something for the farm to think about is putting that on a lease and put both uh, the parents and the successor and probably the successor spouse on that lease and the reason this works so well is either party can make the lease payment, okay? but at the end of the lease, the successor makes the buyout and then we'll take ownership for that asset. Again, we, we're careful here. We always wanna make sure our customers talking to the tax person. I mean, do they need that bonus? Do they need the 179? Now that might trump the lease, but we always expose folks to this. Between related parties, we talk about operating leases. This is the, the, the question we get, or the way it usually goes is, my dad and I had a, a rent to own arrangement, or my neighbor is renting his machinery to his son, and then after 10 years, his son buys it out. Okay. Well, we've got to get into the whole nuts and bolts in this because there are some pretty strict IRS rules about operating leases especially when it comes time to buy them out. It's got to be for the fair market value. Can't, you can't have a discounted buyout or it blows the whole lease. These are particularly effective when we've got uh, parents wanting to sell their machinery to their kids. And, and again, we all know about the uh, installment sale tax rules associated with the sale over time of depreciated assets. The operating lease gets us around this. And number four is the most common where we gift piece by piece each year when something needs to be updated. Uh, you know, it's getting old, the technology isn't there anymore. That can be transferred to a, a successor, either gift or sold, and they then uh, trade it off. It's a great way to move the machinery and, and lessen the machinery that the parents have if they've got in mind perhaps an operating lease later. And always, we always, always have to look at that estate plan to see how it fits with the machinery, the bins and the buildings, because too many times they don't line up. Uh, people don't think this thing through. They set up something with a, a lawyer or maybe even with their accountant and, and no one takes a, a look at the will to see if that's consistent uh, with their plans. Land is usually the last asset to transfer, if at all. <clears throat> um, you know, the thing we'll do when we go in and we want our customers to think the same as how much are you renting versus how much will you own, do you own? How old are your landlords? Um, what's your, you know, what's your risk level for the successor to have to buy out non-family land? <clears throat> so that ties right into the will or trust for our senior farmers. If there is a bot high buyout or a lot of buyouts and their will or trust and their rent and they're also renting a lot of land, 
we have to have a conversation about what happens if your son or daughter who's farming has to buy land from their siblings and all of a sudden the land, which is close, that you've been farming for 30, 40 years, comes up for sale because the owner died and it went to his kids. Is this something you think we need to plan for? And it's just something we want to talk to our customers about. One thing that we hear a lot is we need to protect our land. And uh, we always ask the question, from what? Most of the time it's a nursing home, but sometimes it's an unstable marriage. It's a financially unstable son or daughter who, who just doesn't have good financial skills and doesn't manage well. Uh, so land, the big issue with land when we get in, getting into somebody in their late 60s, or early 70s is protection. So how are we gonna transition? Are we gonna sell it on a contract? Is it gonna be trust owned so a successor can buy it out? Is the entity the way to go? Do we need a life estate? Is nursing home paramount? Uh, or do we, do we just transfer the land to the estate plan? And that's what most customers do because of the step up. Uh, we talk a lot about that. Uh, plus the parents need that income for life uh, and that's, that's their 401k. Um, one thing I've got on the bottom there, if possible, we know sometimes it's not always possible. Avoid leaving land equally to all children in your will of trust. It's, it's become a major source of uh, risk and litigation. I don't know how many farms I've worked with this year where we're working with equally devised land and, and we're just having a battle with some of these families. Um, you think you've got it settled and somebody comes up with something new and we almost have to start all over again. So we like to see land go to children on whole parcels if it can be done, and it's harder on the parents, but then they don't need to work with their siblings um, to decide who rents it. If you do have a sibling who farms and you have whole parcels, then what we want to do is work in rights of refusal for that successor farmer to buy or rent land from a sibling. Next one, Ron. Uh, retirement planning. <laughs> Um, tax control is always the issue here, as you all well may know. Um, the, the issue that stops retirement for most of our customers is servicing debt. Uh, if they want to be done, done, and they've got a lot of debt, then we have to have the conversation about what are you going to sell. Um, and, of course, then that, that immediately goes to the tax conversation. So a lot of debt creates uh, you know, more complexity. What's the time frame? You know, we talk about Social Security, if they're younger, how's the health insurance going to be handled? The tax control, uh, you know, deferring grain is the obvious one. You know, um, you know if you trust your elevator, um, maybe a pension, a 401k or a SEP. Um, you have to really look at the situation here uh, with, with pensions, 401ks and SEPs. Are we just kicking the can down the road? into higher tax brackets, especially if TCJA expires. I mean, we're kicking them probably into a higher bracket, with, especially with a pension or a 401k. But what drives these are the customers today who are getting out where they're seeing their grain sales and their auction sale and all that stuff, put them into the 30% tax bracket, and they don't want to be there. Uh, with an auction, that's almost unavoidable, but if it's if there's no auction and they've got a successor, um, now you've got all this grain sitting there that's either deferred or, or in, sitting in the bin. Uh, we do talk about pensions. Charitable trusts, mostly for machinery. We just don't see a lot of these. Um, we start having the conversation with, with our customer, especially if they die, who gets it. Most often it goes to the charity. Um, but, you know, I've probably done a dozen in my 16 years at Ag Country. And uh, I mean, they work very well. It's a great tax tool, it's good for generating income, but uh, most customers just don't like uh, the complexity and the feeling of giving up control. Next one, Rob. All right, let's get into my favorite topic because it's always the issue that makes things good or bad. You know, we call it glue or gunpowder. Um, Number one, who understands your plan? And the reason I've got understand blue and, high, under, and, and uh, bolded is understanding the plan. Parents sometimes will say, they, yeah, I've talked to my kids. They know what's going on. 
And then you meet with their kids, mostly because they're successors and they really don't know what's going on. So we want to make sure the communication is clear uh, between the parents and especially if there's a successor. Uh, I always tease a little bit, you know, don't make your yard or your shop your Las Vegas. You know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, make sure your spouse knows what's going on. Make sure your family has an idea what you're thinking and why you're doing it. Expectations can be a real driver um, that can be kind of negative. If, you know, if expectations are in your head and you haven't clearly communicated those expectations and they're not being met, I always ask, whose fault is that? Okay. So this is where the assumptions grow. And we suggest it and we tell especially our younger producers, Talk to your parents, make sure they know what you expect, that your expectations may already be in their head or they may not want to want to do that. So it's really important to talk about expectations. I talked about litigation being on the rise and it's almost always a communication issue. Family meetings, we think they're a good idea, but I always put an asterisk here and say, not always, depends on the dynamics. Uh, but Typically, the family wants to know what's going on, and they want to know more so not, they, they want to know what, but most of the families I work with in family meetings are there to learn why mom and dad have things set up the way they do. It's really a, an important thing, especially to those non-farming uh, children. So then the question is, who should attend? If you have a family meeting, should it be just your kids? Should it be kids and spouses? Again, you have to look at the family dynamics. Uh, you have to know a little bit more about it to, to tell them if it's a good idea or not. Remember, if it's just your kids, they're probably going to go home and tell their spouse anyway, and they may not get it right. Uh, so that's not me saying bring spouses. That's me saying think this thing through and make sure that you're considering, um, you know, all the stakeholders. Um we don't always recommend family meetings, as I mentioned, because sometimes it's a tough decision. We've got um, children or we've got uh, our, our in-laws who just, it wouldn't be a constructive meeting. You know, it might cause long-term permanent issues. So we have to really look at these family meetings to see if they're, they're important and if they work. Next one, Ron. All right. There's some rules that never change. In our world, he's been, been doing this for 27 years, and this is the same thing that I've seen year in and year out. Good communication is vital. We encourage people to talk regularly to both your family and your professionals. Don't leave your accountant, your crop insurance, your loan officer, your lawyer out of the conversation. Make sure everybody understands what you're thinking and, and where you, where you want to take things. My favorite one, if it's not in writing, it, it doesn't exist. And uh, it's, this just is rampant. And where, where it really shows up in a bad way is rental agreements, uh, especially between family members. Uh, I had a case uh, a while back. Uh, mom died and son was renting all the land. Uh, no rental agreement. Did not get along with siblings. Uh, the, uh, the land went whole parcel, as we suggested. Uh, no right of refusal for a farming son to rent the land. Um, he lost a bunch of land the next day, next year. It just you know, if he had at least a three-year rental agreement, there would have been some time he could have eased himself out of losing that land. Don't assume, of course, you know, especially the fact that someone understands what you're thinking. Uh, again, we always try to tell our farming parents uh, this. You know, the the proper succession and retirement planning. You know, it, it adds emotional and financial value to your farm and ranch and its legacy. It just felt good. It was a good experience. It was a good process. Uh, and this is where time comes into play. Time is definitely uh, your customers and your clients' friend. So, okay, last slide. You're certainly welcome to reach out and give me a call. Uh, shoot me an email if you've got any questions or want to talk about something. Um, be more than happy to help you. But uh, that should do it. Any, anything else? Uh, 
I, I'm going to look in the chat here. I I think uh, there was a there was a uh, a question here a while ago. Uh, let me see here. What about the def it's uh, does anybody know about the defined re benefit retirement plans? I was told a farmer can put in up to three hundred and thirty thousand and get a deduction as a sole proprietor. Does a farmer need to be need to be an employee with a W two? Uh, and then many accountants don't know about this. So let me, can I take, we're going to run over a little here, Ron. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I'll, I'll, st I'll spend a minute. I do a lot of these. Um, the fine benefit pensions run much differently than a 401k or an IRA in terms of what you can put into one. So every October, you know, we get that report from IRS on, on, on the contribution limits to, to 401ks, IRAs, SEPs, all those documents. So the maximum comps are set um, pretty much by law. Um, a pension is a function of your income, your age, interest rates, and your gender. And the calculation is to, to, to the, the way it's calculated is done by an actuary. <clears throat> so they're going to look at your age and all of those components. The older you are, the more you can put into a pension because a lot of it's based on life expectancy. Yeah. Um, interest rates impact pension contributions. When interest rates were low, we would get routinely maximum contributions for people in their mid 60s that exceeded $500,000 a year. What we're seeing now, um, the, the most I've seen over the last year is about 310 to 320. Um, depends on age. So a pension is a pretty much a giant tax deduction. Uh, it's like an IRA. Uh, it functions like an IRA, you know, in terms of uh, when it's all done, you, you can direct roll it to an IRA or it's subject to the required minimum distribution rules. Um, most of the folks I work with um, are, are sole proprietors, but we do a, a, a number of pensions for corporations and partnerships. Uh, I have one in place right now where one brother's uh, getting out of the partnership. Um, we're going to do a redemption and get his assets out. He's going to have a whole bunch of grain and no tax deductions. And so the pension was a great tool for him to help control his tax bill. They do need to be in place at least three years. Uh, you can make a change to the contribution level. Generally, it's 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 a one-time change. Um, but they're, and they're not for everybody. Um, if, if we're working with a farm that has employees, we say don't do it. Um, Full-time employees. And the, and the reason for that is they have to make a contribution to the employee based on their age, their interest, well, interest rates, their gender. And a lot of producers are okay with that, but some aren't. But the big no-no is, is the audit they get when they terminate that pension, because most of those pensions are audited when they when they terminate them. Plus, during the life of the pension, you have to have uh, pension benefit guarantee association insurance when you have an employee. So uh, we really don't encourage uh, customers with employees to set up a pension. Uh, the perfect world is if we've got a, a successor coming in, and it's a sole proprietor or a corp. Um, and, the, and the farming son isn't going to farm through the corporate, they're going to farm sole proprietorship, move the employee to them the year before you start your pension. And that way we can run the pension and, and get it going. But they're good tools. Uh, the customers that put them in place uh, really seem to like them. So. Okay, thank you. Well, with that, I guess I, I will have to cut it off for today. We're running a little over, but... Uh... Appreciate uh, all, all you presenters here, and some of you are hanging on here too. And Russ, I, I, I guess I didn't even really introduce you. We got so excited about getting your your PowerPoint going there. But but as I always say, a transition is something that uh, that uh, will affect everybody, whether you want it, want want it to or not. Right. So exactly. I, yeah. So so anyway, I want to uh, as I mentioned, uh, thank you the to the presenters. And, and also the presentations are posted and you can download them.
and we are we have recorded this and and it'll take a couple of days before that gets posted but we will have a recording for you and we also have a tax update uh little uh sheet that that we posted as well we will be sending you a uh survey to see how we did and what you liked and did not like about this uh session today it's a Qualtrics survey it may look like some junk email, so don't delete it, uh, but uh, we appreciate your feedback. It helps us design and, 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 and do things for the next year. I want to thank our NDSU team here, Paul, Paul Ann Hawkinson and Scott Swanson, for, for helping out. And so with that, we'll call it a, call it a day and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.